Periphysian. Book 1. Nutrita. As I frequently ponder and, so far as my talents allow, ever more carefully investigate the fact that the first and fundamental division of all things which either can be grasped by the mind or lie beyond its grasp is into those that are and those that are not, there comes to mind as a general term for them all what in Greek is called physis, and in Latin natura. Or do you think otherwise? Alumnus. No, I agree. For I too, when I enter upon the path of reasoning, find that this is so. Nature, then, is the general name, as we said, for all things, for those that are and those that are not. It is. For nothing at all can come into our thought that would not fall under this term. Then since we agree to use this term for the genus, I should like you to suggest a method for its division by differentiations into species, or, if you wish, I shall first attempt a division, and your part will be to offer sound criticism. Pray begin. For I am impatient to hear from you a true account of this matter. It is my opinion that the division of nature by means of four differences results in four species, being divided, first into that which creates and is not created, secondly into that which is created and also creates, thirdly into that which is created and does not create, while the fourth neither creates nor is created. But within these four there are two pairs of opposites. For the third is the opposite of the first, the fourth of the second, but the fourth is classed among the impossibles, for it is of its essence that it cannot be. Does such a division seem right to you or not? Right, certainly. But please go over it again so as to elucidate more fully the oppositions within these four forms. I am sure you see the opposition of the third species to the first, for the first creates and is not created, it therefore has as its contrary that, which is created and does not create, and of the second to the fourth, for the second both is created and creates, it therefore has as its contrary in all respects the fourth, which neither creates nor is created. I see that, clearly. But I am much perplexed by the fourth species which you have introduced. For about the other three, I should not presume to raise any question at all, because, as I think, the first is understood to be the cause of all things that are, and that are not, who is God, the second to be the primordial causes, and the third those things that become manifest through coming into being in times and places. For this reason a more detailed discussion which shall take each species individually is required, as I think. You are right to think so. But in what order we should pursue our path of reasoning, that is to say, which of the species of nature we should take first, I leave it to you to decide. It seems to me beyond question that before the omers we should say of the first species whatever the light of minds has granted us to utter. Let it be so. But first I think a few words should be said about the first and fundamental, division, as we called it, of all things into the things that are and the things that are not. It would be correct and wise to do so. For I see no other beginning from which reasoning ought to start, and this not only because this difference is the first of all, but because both in appearance and in fact it is more obscure than the others. This basic difference, then, which separates all things requires for itself five modes of interpretation. One of these modes the first seems to be that by means of which reason convinces us that all things which fall within the perception of bodily sense or, within the grasp of, intelligence are truly and reasonably said to be, but that those which because of the excellence of their nature elude not only all sense but also all intellect and reason rightly seem not to be, which are correctly understood only of God and matter and of the reasons and essences of all the things that are created by him. And rightly so, for as Dionysius the Areopagite says, he is the essence of all things who alone truly is. For, says he, the being of all things is the divinity who is above being. Gregory the theologian too proves by many arguments that no substance or essence of any creature, whether visible or invisible, can be comprehended by the intellect or by reason as to what it is. For just as God as he is in himself beyond every creature is comprehended by no intellect, so is he equally incomprehensible when considered in the innermost depths of the creature which was made by him and which exists in him, while whatsoever in every creature is either perceived by the bodily sense or contemplated by the intellect is merely some accident to each creature's essence which, as has been said, by itself is incomprehensible, but which, either by quality or by quantity or by form, or by matter or by some difference or by place or by time, is known not as to what it is but as to that it is. That, then, is the first and fundamental mode, of division, of those things of which it is said that they are and those, of which it is said, that they are not. For what somehow appears to be, a mode of division, based upon privations of substances and accidents should certainly not be admitted, in my opinion. 
For how can that which absolutely is not, and cannot be, and which does not surpass the intellect because of the preeminence of its existence, be included in the division of things? Unless perhaps someone should say that the absences and privations of things that exist are themselves not altogether nothing, but are implied by some strange natural virtue of those things of which they are the privations and absences and oppositions, so as to have some kind of existence. 2. Let then the second mode of being and not being be that which is seen in the orders and differences of created natures, which, beginning from the intellectual power, which is the highest and is constituted nearest to God, descends to the furthermost, degree, of the rational, and irrational, creature, or, to speak more plainly, from the most exalted angel to the furthermost element of the rational, and irrational, soul, I mean the nutritive and growth-giving life principle, which is the least part of the soul in the general acceptance of the term because it nourishes the body and makes it grow. Here, by a wonderful mode of understanding, each order, including the last at the lower end, which is that of bodies and in which the whole division comes to an end, can be said to be and not to be. For an affirmation concerning the lower, order, is a negation concerning the higher, and so too a negation concerning the lower, order, is an affirmation concerning the higher, and similarly an affirmation concerning the higher, order, is a negation concerning the lower, while a negation concerning the higher, order, will be an affirmation concerning the lower. Thus, the affirmation of man, I mean, man while still in his mortal state, is the negation of angel, while the negation of man is the affirmation of angel, and vice versa. For if man is a rational, mortal, risable animal, then an angel is certainly neither a rational animal nor mortal nor risable. Likewise, if an angel is an essential intellectual motion about God and the causes of things, then man is certainly not an essential intellectual motion about God and the causes of things. And the same rule is found to apply in all the celestial essences until one reaches the highest order of all. This, however, terminates, in, the highest negation, upward, for its negation confirms the existence of no higher creature. Now, there are three orders which they call of equal rank, the first of these are the cherubim, seraphim, and thrones, the second, the virtues, powers, and dominations, the third, the principalities, archangels, and angels. Downwards, on the other hand, the last, order, merely, denies or confirms the one above it, because it has nothing below it which it might either take away or establish, since it is preceded by all the orders higher than itself but precedes none that is lower than itself. It is also on these grounds that every order of rational or intellectual creatures is said to be and not to be, it is in so far as it is known by the orders above it and by itself, but it is not in so far as it does not permit itself to be comprehended by the orders that are below it. 3. The third mode can suitably be seen in those things of which the visible plenitude of this world is made up, and in their causes in the most secret folds of nature, which precede them. For whatsoever of these causes through generation is known as to matter and form, as to times and places, is by a certain human convention said to be, while whatsoever is still held in those folds of nature and is not manifest as to form or matter, place or time, and the other accidents, by the same convention referred to is said not to be. Clear examples of this mode are provided over a wide range, of experience, and especially in human nature. Thus, since God in that first and one man whom he made in his image established all men at the same time, yet did not bring them all at the same time into this visible world, but brings the nature which he considers all at one time into visible essence at certain times and places according to a certain sequence which he himself knows, those who already, are becoming, or, have become visibly manifest in the world are said to be, while those who are as yet hidden, though destined to be, are said. Not to be. Between the first and third, mode, there is this difference, the first, is found, generically in all things which at the same time and once for all have been made in, their, causes and effects, the third specifically in those which partly are still hidden in their causes, partly are manifest in, their, effects, of which in particular the fabric of this world is woven. To this mode belongs the reasoning which considers the potentiality of seeds, whether in animals or in trees or in plants. For during the time when the potentiality of the seeds is latent in the recesses of nature, because it is not yet manifest it is said not to be, but when it has become manifest in the birth and growth of animals or of flowers or of the fruits of trees and plants it is said to be. For, the fourth mode is that which, not improbably according to the philosophers, declares that only those things which are contemplated by the intellect alone truly are, while those things which in generation, through the expansions or contractions of matter, and the intervals of places and motions of times are changed, brought together, or dissolved, are said not to be truly, as is the case with all bodies which can come into being and pass away. 
5. The fifth mode is that which reason observes only in human nature, which, when through sin it renounced the honor of the divine image in which it was properly substantiated, deservedly lost its being and therefore is said not to be, but when, restored by the grace of the only begotten Son of God, it is brought back to the former condition of its substance in which it was made after the image of God, it begins to be, and in him who has been made in the image of God begins to live. It is to this mode, it seems, that the Apostle's saying refers, and he calls the things that are not as the things that are, that is to say, those who in the first man were lost and had fallen into a kind of non-subsistence God the Father calls through faith, in his Son, to be as those who are already reborn in Christ. But this too may also be understood of those whom God daily calls forth from the secret folds of nature, in which they are considered not to be, to become visibly manifest in form and matter and in the other, conditions, in which hidden things are able to become manifest. Although keener reasoning can discover some modes besides these, yet I think at the present, stage, enough has been said about these things, unless you disagree. Quite plainly so except that I am rather perplexed by what St. Augustine appears to have said in his Hexameron, namely that the angelic nature was established before every other creature, not in time but in status, and on this account it contemplated the primordial causes, that is, those primary exemplars which the Greeks call prototypa even of others besides its own, first in God, then the creatures themselves and their effects. For it cannot have known its own cause before it proceeded into its proper species. Not even that should worry you, but consider more closely what has been said. For if we say that the angels knew the primary causes of things as they are constituted in God we shall seem to go against the Apostle, who affirms that God himself and the causes of all things in him, if they are not other than what he himself is, are above all that is said and understood, and therefore we must steer a straight and middle course, avoiding the appearance of either going against the Apostle or of not holding the opinion of a teacher of weighty and sacred authority. Therefore, that each has spoken the truth must not be doubted, nay rather, must strongly be maintained. So reason permits us to say that the cause of all things, which surpasses all understanding, does not become known, according to the Apostle, to any created nature. For who, says he, has known the intellect of the Lord? And in another place, the peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding. But if the cause of all things is inaccessible to all things that are created by it, then there can be no doubt but that the reasons of all things, which exist, in it, eternally and without change, are completely inaccessible to all things of which they are the reasons. And yet anyone who might say that in the intellects of the angels there are certain theophanies of those reasons, that is to say, certain, divine, manifestations which are comprehensible to the intellectual nature, but which are not the reasons, i.e. the primary exemplars, themselves, will not, I think, stray from the truth. And we believe that St. Augustine was not incorrect when he said that these theophanies were beheld in the angelic nature before the generation of all the natures that are below it. So let us not worry about having said that the angels behold the causes of the lower creature, and, that they do so, first in God, then in themselves. For it is not only the divine essence that is indicated by the word God, but also that mode by which God reveals himself in a certain way to the intellectual and rational creature, according to the capacity of each, is often called God in Holy Scripture. This mode the Greeks are accustomed to call theophany, that is, self-manifestation of God. An example of it is, I saw the Lord sitting, and other similar expressions, since it is not his essence that, the prophet, saw, but something created by him. Therefore it is not to be wondered at that the angel should be understood to possess, in a certain sense, a threefold knowledge, one, that is, from above, which, coming, from the eternal reasons of things, is reproduced first in him after the mode just mentioned, then that which he receives from what is above him he commits to himself as it were in a wondrous and ineffable memory, some sort of image, as it were, reproducing an image, and hence, if he can by this mode have knowledge of what is above him, who would dare say that he has not in him some knowledge of what is below? With truth therefore is it said that those things that can be comprehended by the reason and by the intellect are, and with equal truth that those things which surpass all reason and intellect are not. What then shall we say of that happiness to come which is promised to the saints, which we consider to be nothing else, but the pure and unmediated contemplation of the divine essence itself? As St. John the Evangelist says, we know that we are the sons of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be. But when that shall have appeared we shall be like unto him for we shall see him as he is. In the same way the Apostle Paul, now we see in a mirror and obscurely, but then face to face. Also St. Augustine in his books on the City of God says, I think, of the contemplation that is to be of the divine essence, 
through the bodies that we shall put on, in every body we see wherever we turn the eyes of our body we shall contemplate with translucent clarity God himself. For if the eminence of the divine essence surpasses the purest power of angelic contemplation since it has been established by the foregoing arguments that the divine essence is comprehensible to no intellectual creature, which without doubt consists chiefly in the angels, and the happiness promised to us is no other than equality with the angelic nature how will the happiness of human nature be able to contemplate the eminence of the divine essence? Shrewdly and observantly, spoken. For your difficulty here is not without cause. Nevertheless, I should have thought you were sufficiently answered by what we have already pointed out in general concerning every creature. What was that? Please go over it again. Did we not make the general assertion that the divine essence is in itself comprehensible to no bodily sense, to no reason, to no intellect, whether of man or of angel? I remember, and I cannot deny that I accepted it. But, as it seems to me, that conclusion you refer to will be wholly invalidated by our allowing to the intellectual creature a contemplation of the divine essence in itself, or, if it cannot be invalidated since it has been confirmed by the surest arguments, you will have to show by sound reasons and probable examples the mode of divine contemplation that is promised to the saints in the time to come, and in which the angels subsist at all times. What mode it is you seek I know not, unless it be that which we have just now been briefly discussing. What that is I should like you to tell me again, for I do not remember it. Do you remember the agreement we reached when we were speaking about the hexameron of the Holy Father Augustine? I do remember, but I should like to hear you a second time, on this subject. Your difficulty was, as I think, how this father, said, that the angels contemplated the causes of the things that were to be created, which are eternally in God and which are God, first in God, then in themselves, then the proper species and, specific, differences of the creatures themselves, if the divine essence, together with the reasons which are in it, cannot be comprehensible essentially. I remember it all. Do you remember our answer to these points? Yes, I recall, if my memory does not deceive me, you were saying that it is not the causes of things themselves, which subsist in the divine essence, that the angels beheld but certain divine manifestations which, so you say, the Greeks call theophanies, and which take their names from the eternal causes of which they are the images. You further added that not only the divine essence itself which exists in itself without change was called God, but that also the theophanies which are reproduced out of it and by it in the intellectual nature are themselves given the name of God. You remember clearly. For this is what we said. But how does it concern the present task? Not a little, in my opinion. For that is the mode in which I think the angels behold God all the time, and the righteous in this life when they experience ecstasy and in the world to come when they will see him as the angels do. Then we shall not see God himself in himself, for not even the angels do so since this is impossible for every creature. For he alone, as the apostle says, possesses immortality and dwells in inaccessible light, but we shall contemplate certain theophanies which are made in us by him. No. For from the one and the same form which all things desire, I mean the word of God, each shall receive a form according to the degree of his own sanctity and wisdom. For, the form, itself says of itself in the gospel, in my father's house are many mansions, calling itself the house of its father because while it is one and the same, form, and remains unchanging, it will be multiple to the sight of those to whom it shall be given to dwell in it. For each one, as we have said, shall possess in himself knowledge of the only begotten word of God up to the measure that grace will bestow upon him. For as great as is the number of the elect, so great will be the number of the mansions, as much as shall be the multiplication of holy souls, so much will be the possession of divine theophanies. It seems likely. Well do you say, likely? For who on such matters, would say with assurance, that the case was thus and not otherwise when they would seem to exceed the strength of man's grasp while, he is, still in this fragile flesh? But I should like you to expound to me briefly what you can guess about this theophany, that is, what it is, whence it is, where it is, whether it is formed without us or within. It is a deep thing you ask, and I do not know what deeper thing there can be for human inquiry. However, I will say what I have been able to discover about this subject in the books of the Holy Fathers who have been bold enough to speak of such things. Please do. So you ask what it is, and whence, and where? Yes. We find that Maximus, the monk, a godly philosopher, has treated of this theophany most profoundly and subtly in his commentary on the homilies of Gregory the Theologian. 
For he says that theophany is effected from no other cause but God, but that it happens as a result of the condescension of the divine word, that is, of the only begotten Son who is the wisdom of the Father, downwards, as it were, upon human nature which was created and purified by him, and of the exaltation upwards of human nature to the aforesaid word by divine love. By condescension I mean here not that which has already taken place through the incarnation but that which is brought about by theosis, that is to say, the deification, of the creature. So from this condescension of the wisdom of God upon human nature through grace, and the exaltation of the same nature to that same wisdom through choice, theophany is brought about. With this interpretation the Holy Father Augustine seems to agree in his exposition of that passage from the Apostle, He who is made unto us righteousness and wisdom, for he expounds it as follows, the Father's wisdom, in which and through which all things were made, which is not created but creating, comes into being in our souls by some ineffable condescension of compassion and attaches to itself our intellect so that in some ineffable manner a kind of composite wisdom, as it were, is formed out of its descending upon us and dwelling in us, and out of our understanding which through love is raised up by it to itself and is formed in it. In the same way, concerning righteousness and the other virtues he teaches that they derive from no other source than a certain wondrous and ineffable confirmation of the divine wisdom and our own understanding. For, as Maxima says, as far as the human intellect ascends through charity, so far does the divine wisdom descend through compassion, and it is this that is the cause and the substance of all the virtues. Therefore every theophany, that is, every virtue, both in this life, in which it is still only beginning to take shape, in those, who are worthy to be formed, and in the future life, in those who, shall receive the perfection of the divine beatitude, is effected not externally but internally out of God and out of themselves. It is from God, then, that the theophanies happen through grace in the angelic nature, and in human nature when it has been illuminated, purified, and perfected, as a consequence of the descent of the divine wisdom and of the ascent of the human and angelic understanding. Clearly. For, consistent with this is, the statement, of the same Maximus that whatever the intellect shall have been able to comprehend, that it itself becomes. Therefore, to the extent that the mind comprehends virtue, to that extent it becomes virtue itself. But if you require examples of these things, they are plainly set forth by the same Maximus, for just as air illuminated by the sun appears to be nothing else but light, not because it loses its own nature, but because the light prevails in it so that it is believed itself to be light, so human nature when it is united with God is said to be God through and through, not because it ceases to be, its own, nature but because it receives a share in divinity so that only God appears to be in it. Also, when there is no light present the air is dark, while the light of the sun as it subsists by itself is comprehended by no bodily sense. But when the sunlight mingles with air, then it begins to appear, so that in itself it is incomprehensible to the senses, but when mixed with air it can be comprehended by the senses. And from this you are to understand that the divine essence is incomprehensible in itself, but when it is joined to an intellectual creature it becomes after a wondrous fashion manifest, so that the former, I mean the divine essence, is seen alone in the latter, namely the intellectual creature. For the ineffable excellence of the former surpasses every nature which participates in it, so that in all things nothing else but itself is presented to those that have understanding, while in itself, as we have said, it is not manifest in any fashion. I quite see what you wish me to understand, but as to whether it can stand together with the words of the Holy Father Augustine, I am not sufficiently clear. Be more attentive then, and let us return to those words of his which we first cited. They are these, I think, in the twenty-second, book, on the city of God, through the bodies that we shall, have, put on, in every body we see wherever we turn the eyes of our body, we shall contemplate with translucent clarity God himself. Note the sense of the words. For he did not say, through the bodies we shall, have, put on we shall contemplate God himself, for in himself he cannot be seen, but he said, through the bodies we shall, have, put on, in every body we see, we shall contemplate God himself. Therefore it is through bodies in bodies, not through himself, that he shall be seen. Similarly, it is through intellect in intellects, through reason in reasons, not through itself, that the divine essence shall appear. For so strongly shall the excellence of the divine power be manifested in the life to come to all those who shall be worthy of its contemplation that nothing but itself shall be apparent in either these bodies or these intellects. For God shall be all in all, as if the scripture said plainly, God alone shall be manifest in all things. 
Hence the holy Job declares, even in my flesh I shall see God, which is as if he had said, in this flesh of mine, which is afflicted with many trials, there shall come to be such glory that, in the same way as nothing is now manifest in it but death and corruption, so in the life to come nothing in it will be manifest to me but God alone, who in very truth is life and immortality and incorruptibility. But if such was the glory to which he looked forward in respect of his body's felicity, what are we to think will be his spirit status? Especially as, in the words of great Gregory the theologian, the bodies of the saints shall be changed into reason, their reason into intellect, their intellect into God, and thus the whole of their nature shall be changed into very God. Many most excellent examples of this have been adduced by the aforesaid Maximus in his exposition of Gregory, one of which we have already mentioned in speaking of the air. But now we shall introduce a second, which concerns iron and fire. For when iron is melted in fire and reduced to a liquid, nothing of its nature appears to the senses to remain, but all is changed into the quality of fire, and it is by the reason alone that it is known to preserve its own nature, though reduced to a liquid state. So, just as the air appears holy as light, an iron when melted appears to take on wholly the quality of fire, as we have said, and in fact to be fire, although their substances persist, so the sound intellect must hold that after the end of this world every nature, whether corporeal or incorporeal, will seem to be only God, while preserving the integrity of its nature, so that even God, who in himself is incomprehensible, is after a certain mode comprehended in the creature, while the creature itself by an ineffable miracle is changed into God. But let these words suffice, if their meaning is clear to you. It is certainly as clear as such things are permitted to be to our minds, for concerning what is ineffable who in this life can speak with such clarity as to leave nothing more for inquirers to wish for especially as we are promised no other glory than knowledge by direct experience in the life to come of those things which here, on earth, are believed by faith, and inquired into and, as far as may be, commended by reason. Your opinion is cautious and sensible. And now, I think, we must return to the task we have set ourselves, namely to the division of nature. Certainly we must return to it, for in what is going to be said some sort of moderation must be observed if it is ever to come to a conclusion. Well, then, of the aforesaid divisions of nature the first difference, as has seemed to us, is that which creates and is not created. And rightly so, for such a species of nature is correctly predicated only of God, who, since he alone creates all things, is understood to be Adarchos. That is, without beginning, because he alone is the principal cause of all things which are made from him and through him, and therefore he is also the end of all things that are from him, for it is he towards whom all things strive. Therefore he is the beginning, the middle and the end, the beginning because from him are all things that participate in essence, the middle, because in him and through him they subsist and move, the end, because it is towards him that they move in seeking rest from their movement and the stability of their perfection. I most firmly believe and, as far as I may, understand that only of the divine cause of all things is this rightly predicated, for it alone creates all things that are from it, and is not itself created by any cause which is superior, to itself, or precedes it. For it is the supreme and unique cause of all things which take their existence from it and exist in it. But I would like to know your opinion about this. For I am not a little perplexed when I so often find in the books of the Holy Fathers who have attempted to treat of the divine nature that not only does it create all things that are, but itself also is created. For, according to them, it makes and is made, and creates and is created. If, then, this is the case, I do not find it easy to see how our reasoning may stand. For we say that it creates only, but is not created by anything. You have every reason for being perplexed. For I too am greatly puzzled by this, and I should like, to be able, to learn, by, your guidance how it can be that these, statements, which seem to contradict one another, are prevented from conflicting, with one another, and how to approach this question according to right reason. Please speak first yourself. For in such matters I look to you rather than to myself for an opinion, and for a lead in reasoning. First, then, I think we must consider that name which is so commonly used in Holy Scripture, that is, the name of, God. For although there are many names by which the divine nature is called, such as goodness, essence, truth, and others of this kind, yet that is the name which most frequently occurs in Scripture. It is certainly seen to be so. Of this name, then, an etymology has been taken over from the Greeks, for either it is derived from the verb Theoro That is, I see, or from the verb Theo 
That is, I run, or, which is more likely, since, the meaning of both is, one and, the same, it is correctly held to be derived from both. For when it is derived from the verb. Theoro, theos. Is interpreted to mean he who sees, for he sees in himself all things that are, while, he looks upon nothing that is outside himself because outside him there is nothing. But when. Theos. Is derived from the verb. Theo. It is correctly interpreted, he who runs, for he runs throughout all things and never stays but by his running fills out all things, as it is written, his word runneth swiftly. And yet he is not moved at all. For of God, it is most truly said that he is motion at rest and rest in motion. For he is at rest unchangingly in himself, never departing from the stability of his nature, yet he sets himself in motion through all things in order that those things which essentially subsist by him may be. For by his motion all things are made. And thus there is one and the same meaning in the two interpretations of the same name, which is God. For in God to run through all things is not something other than to see all things, but as by his seeing so too by his running all things are made. What has been said of the etymology of the name is sufficient and convincing. But I do not satisfactorily see whether he may move who is everywhere, without whom nothing can be, and beyond whom nothing extends. For he is the place and the circumference of all things. I did not say that God moves beyond himself, but from himself in himself towards himself. For it ought not to be believed that there is any motion in him except that of his will, by which he wills all things to be made, just as his rest, is understood, not as though he comes to rest after motion, but as the immovable determination of his same will, by which he limits all things so that they remain in the immutable stability of their reasons. For properly speaking there is in him neither rest nor motion. For these two are seen to be opposites one of the other. But right reason forbids us to suppose or understand that there are opposites in him, especially as rest is, properly speaking, the end of motion, whereas God does not begin to move in order that he may attain to some end. Therefore these names, like many similar ones also, are transferred from the creature by a kind of divine metaphor to the creator. Not without reason, for of all things that are at rest or in motion he is the cause. For from him they begin to run in order that they may be, since he is the principle of them all, and, through him, they are carried towards him by their natural motion so that in him they may rest immutably and eternally since he is the end and rest of them all. For beyond him there is nothing that they strive for since in him they find the beginning and end of their motion. God, therefore, is called he who runs not because he runs beyond himself, who is always immutably at rest in himself, who fills out all things, but because he makes all things run from a state of non-existence into one of existence. Return to the subject. For these things seem to be not unreasonably spoken. Please tell me which subject you mean. For in trying to say something about intervening questions we commonly forget the main one. Was not this the task we set ourselves? to try our best to find out on what grounds those who treat of the divine nature say that the same nature creates and is created. For that it creates all things no one of sound intellect is in doubt, but how it is said to be created is not, we thought, a question to be cursorily passed over. Just so. But, as I think, in what has already been said considerable headway has been made towards the solution of this question. For we agreed that the motion of the divine nature is to be understood as nothing else but the purpose of the divine will to establish the things that are to be made. Therefore it is said that in all things the divine nature is being made, which is nothing else than the divine will. For in that nature being is not different from willing, but willing and being are one and the same in the establishment of all things that are to be made. For example, one might say, this is the end to which the motion of the divine will is directed, that the things that are may be. Therefore it creates all things which it leads forth out of nothing so that they may be, from not being into being, but it is, also, created because nothing except itself exists as an essence since itself is the essence of all things. For as there is nothing that is good by its nature, except, the divine nature, itself, but everything which is said to be good is so by participation in the one supreme good, so everything which is said to exist exists not in itself but by participation in the nature which truly exists. Not only, therefore, as was mentioned earlier in our discussion, is the divine nature said to be made when in those who are reformed by faith and hope and charity and the other virtues the word of God in a miraculous and ineffable manner is born, as the Apostle says, speaking of Christ, who from God is made in us wisdom and justification and sanctification and redemption, but also, because that which is invisible in itself becomes manifest in all things that are, it is not inappropriately. 
said to be made. For our intellect also, before it enters upon thought and memory, is not unreasonably said, not to be. For in itself it is invisible and known only to God and ourselves, but when it enters upon thoughts and takes shape in certain fantasies it is not inappropriately said to come into being. For it does so in the memory when it receives certain forms, of things and sounds and colors and other, sensibles, for it had no form before it entered into the memory, then it receives, as it were, a second formation when it takes the form of certain signs of, a forms and, sounds, I mean the letters which are the signs of sounds, and the figures which are the signs of mathematical forms, or other perceptible indicators by which it can be communicated to the senses of sentient beings. By this analogy, far removed as it is from the divine nature, I think it can be shown all the same how that nature, although it creates all things and cannot be created by anything, is in an admirable manner created in all things which take their being from it, so that, as the intelligence of the mind or its purpose or its intention or however this first and innermost motion of ours may be called, having, as we said, entered upon thought and received the forms of certain fantasies, and having then proceeded into the symbols of sounds or the signs of sensible motions, is not inappropriately said to become. For, being in itself without any sensible form, it becomes formed in fantasies, so the divine essence which when it subsists by itself surpasses every intellect is correctly said to be created in those things which are made by itself and through itself and in itself, and for itself, so that in them either by the intellect, if they are only intelligible, or by the sense, if they are sensible, it comes to be known by those who investigate it in the right spirit. Enough has been said about this, I think. Quite enough, unless I am mistaken. But it is still necessary for you to explain why the divine nature is only called creative and not created, if, as the aforesaid reasons have shown, it both creates and is created. For there seems to be a contradiction here. You are very attentive. For I see that this too merits investigation. Certainly it merits it. Listen then to what follows and apply the mind's eye to this brief answer of mine. Go on. I will follow attentively. That the divine nature is the founder of the universe you do not doubt. Proceed to what follows. For to hesitate over this would be impiety. Similarly that it is created by nothing you perceive by faith and by intellect. I perceive, nothing more surely. Then when you hear that it is created, you are not placed in doubt as to its being created not by another nature but by itself. No. Well, then, is it not in any case creating whether it creates itself or the essences that are created by it? For when it is said that it creates itself the true meaning is nothing else but that it is establishing the natures of things. For the creation of itself, that is, the manifestation of itself in something, is surely that by which all things subsist. What has been said up to now seems probable. But I should like to hear what theology teaches about this ineffable and incomprehensible nature which is the creator and cause of all things, that is, whether it exists, what it is, of what sort it is, and how it is defined. Does not this very theology which you have just mentioned, which is concerned entirely or for the most part with the divine nature, hold, plainly enough for those who can see the truth, that from what has been created by itself one can deduce merely that this nature subsists as an essence, but not what that essence is? For, as we have often said, it exceeds not only the endeavors of human reasoning, but even the most pure intellects of the celestial essences. But the theologians have correctly deduced from the things that are that it is, and from their divisions into essences, genera, species, differences and individuals that it is wise, and from the stable motion and moving rest of all things that it lives. In this way they also discovered the great truth that the cause of all things is of a threefold substance. For, as we said, from the essence of the things that are it is understood to be, from the marvelous order of things that it is wise, from their motion it is found to be life. Therefore the cause and creative nature of all things is, and is wise, and lives. And from this those who search out the truth have handed down that in its essence is understood the Father, in its wisdom the Son, in its life the Holy Spirit. These things have been made sufficiently clear to me, and I see that they are very true. It is, of course, quite impossible to define what or of what kind it is, since what quite refuses to be understood is quite impossible to be defined. But I should like to hear for what reason the theologians have dared to predicate of the cause of all things unity in Trinity. Over this last question of yours we need not expend much labor, especially as the theologian Saint Dionysius the Areopagite expounds for us with the utmost truth and by the surest arguments the mysteries of the divine unity and Trinity. 
for he says, there is no way of signifying by verb or noun or any other part of articulated speech how the supreme and causal essence of all things can be signified. For it is not unity or trinity of such a kind as can be conceived by any human intellect however pure, or by any angelic intellect however serene, but in order that the religious inclinations of pious minds may have something to think and something to say concerning that which is ineffable and incomprehensible, especially for the benefit of those who demand from Catholics a rational account of the Christian religion, either, if they are well disposed, because they wish to learn the truth, or, if they are ill-disposed, as an opportunity for attacking and criticizing it, these religious expressions by which the faith is symbolized have been both devised and handed down by the holy theologians so that we may believe in our hearts and confess with our lips that the divine goodness is constituted in three substances of one essence. And even this, truth, was discovered only in the light of spiritual understanding and rational investigation, for in contemplating, as far as the enlightenment of the Spirit of God would take them, the one and ineffable cause of all things and the one simple and indivisible principle they affirmed the unity, and then by observing that this unity did not consist in any singularity or barrenness they gained an understanding of the three substances of the unity, namely the unbegotten and the begotten and the preceding. Now, they called the condition, that is, the relation, of the unbegotten substance to the begotten substance father, the condition of the begotten to the unbegotten substance son, and the condition of the preceding substance to the unbegotten and to the begotten substance Holy Spirit. But since the attention of the holy commentators of Holy Scripture is almost entirely concentrated upon this subject, enough, I think, has been said for the present. Quite enough, but I should like to hear a plainer account of the condition of the three divine substances, for it would be possible for someone to take these mystical names of the Holy Trinity, namely, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, as referring not to their condition, but to their nature, for Father seems to be the name of the substance of the Father, and similarly Son the name of the substance of the Son, and the denomination Holy Spirit also seems to signify nothing other than His. Substance Perhaps we too should not deny that we believe and profess just this if the supreme and venerable authority of St. Gregory the theologian and the assent of sound reason did not prohibit us from believing such things. For when he was questioned by the Eunomians, those most virulent adversaries of the Catholic faith, concerning this name of Father, whether it signified a nature or an operation, enlightened by divine grace he made a wonderful reply, saying that it was, the name, neither of a nature nor of an operation, but only of the relation to the Son. For were he to reply that Father was the name of a nature, they would at once follow this up by saying that similarly Son also was the name of a nature, but if this were granted, it would necessarily follow that Father was the name of one nature and Son of another. For in one and the same nature there cannot be two names differing the one from the other, and from this they would make their point that Father and Son were Eterusias. that is, of diverse essence or nature. Of like, wisdom, was his answer concerning operation, for if it were granted them that Father was the name of an operation, they would promptly conclude that the Son was a creature since Father was admitted to be the name of his operation, that is, of his creation. Most certainly this was a praiseworthy reply, and one inspired by truth. But we ought to look into it a little more closely. For, as it seems to me, they would not immediately be able to blame him even if he did say that Father was the name of a nature. Why should they? Is it impossible for two names, differing from one another in sound, but not in sense, to be understood in one and the same nature, when we see that both Abraham and Isaac, that is, a father and a son, signify one nature? For it is not that Abraham is the name of one nature and Isaac of another, but both are of one and the same nature. You would be correct in what you say if you could equally assert that, in this example of yours of Abraham and Isaac, what is meant by Abraham and Isaac is not different from what in their case is meant by father and son. For as well as Abraham being Abraham's, own, name, father, too is a name applying to the same Abraham. In like manner also, as well as Isaac being Isaac's name, son, too is a name applying to the same Isaac. But Abraham and father, or Isaac and son are not predicated of the same thing. For it is to the substance of Abraham, that is, to the special person that he is, that Abraham refers, whereas no one of sound understanding would doubt that when he is called father, the reference is to his relationship to his son Isaac. The same must be understood of Isaac. For by this name Isaac is meant his own individual substance, whereas what is made known by son is his condition in respect of his father. For you cannot deny that such names, that is, father and son, denote relation and not substance. 
If, then, among us, that is, in, the case of, human nature, these names are predicated not substantially but relatively, what are we to say in the case of the supreme and holy essence in which Holy Scripture has established such names, namely, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, for the mutual relation, that is, condition, of the substances? I now see the reply of the holy theologian to be completely supported by the truth. For, as has been shown, whether in the divine nature, or the human, the name of a relation cannot be applied to a substance or essence. But I should like to hear from you, clearly and succinctly, whether all the categories for they are ten in number, can truly and properly be predicated, of the supreme one essence in three substances of the divine goodness, and of the three substances in the same one essence. On this subject I know of no one who could speak succinctly and clearly. For in such a matter as this either one should keep wholly silent and resign oneself to the simplicity of the orthodox faith, for it surpasses every intellect, as it is written, Thou who alonest immortality and dwellest in inaccessible light, or, if one has begun to discuss it, one will have to show in many ways and by many arguments what is likely to be the truth, making use of the two branches of theology, the affirmative, which by the Greeks is called kataphatiki, and the negative, which is named the one, that is, Apophatiki denies that the divine essence or substance is any one of the things that are, that is, of the things which can be discussed or understood, but the other. Kataphatiki predicates of it all the things that are, and for that reason is called affirmative, not that it affirms that it is any of the things that are, but, because, it teaches that all things which take their being from it can be predicated of it. For that which is the cause can reasonably be expressed in terms of the things that are caused. For it says that it is truth, goodness, essence, light, justice, sun, star, spirit, water, lion, bear, worm, and innumerable other things, and not only does it draw its lessons about it from those things which accord with nature, but from the things which are contrary to nature, since it describes it as being drunken, and, foolish, and, mad. But of these things it is not our present purpose to speak, for enough is said about such things by Saint Dionysius the Areopagite in his, Symbolic Theology, and therefore we may return to the question you have asked. For you had inquired whether, all, the categories are, properly, to be predicated of God or, only, some of them. Yes, let us return to that. But first I think we must ponder why the names you have mentioned, I mean essence, goodness, truth, justice, wisdom, and others of that sort, which seem to be concerning. Kataphatiki. And. Apophatiki. Not merely divine but the divinest, and to signify nothing else, but that divine substance or essence, are said by the aforementioned Holy Father and theologian to be metaphorical, that is, to have been transferred from the creature to the Creator. For I think it must be considered that he had some mystical and hidden reason for saying so. You observe well. Here too is something which I see should not be passed over without consideration, and therefore I should like you to tell me whether you understand that anything opposed to God or conceived alongside of him exists. By opposed I mean either deprived of him or contrary to him or related to him or absent from him, while by conceived alongside of him I mean something that is understood to exist eternally with him without being of the same essence with him. I see clearly what you mean. And therefore I should not dare to say that there is either anything that is opposed to him, or anything understood in association with him which is Eterusion. That is, which is of another essence than what he is. For opposites by relation are always so opposed to one another that they both begin to be at the same time and cease to be at the same time, whether they are of the same nature, like single to double or two-thirds to three-halves, or of different natures, like light and darkness, or in respect of privation, like death and life, sound and silence. For these are correctly thought to belong to the things which are subject to coming into being and passing away. For those things which are in discord with one another cannot be eternal. For if they were eternal they would not be in discord with one another, since eternity is always like what it is and ever eternally subsists in itself as a single and indivisible unity. For it is the one beginning of all things, and their one end, in no way at discord with itself. For the same reason I do not know of anyone who would be so bold as to affirm that anything is co-eternal with God which is not co-essential with him. For if such a thing can be conceived or discovered it necessarily follows that there is not one principle of all things, but two or more, widely differing from each other which right reason invariably rejects without any hesitation. For from the one all things take their being, from two or more nothing. You judge correctly, as I think. 
If therefore the aforesaid divine names are confronted by other names directly opposed to them, the things which are properly signified by them must also of necessity be understood to have contraries opposite to them, and therefore they cannot properly be predicated of God, to whom nothing is opposed, and with whom nothing is found to be co-eternal which differs from him by nature. For right reason cannot find a single one of the names already mentioned or others like them to which another name, disagreeing with it, being opposed or differing from it within the same genus, is not found, and what we know to be the case with the names we must necessarily know to be so with the, things, which are signified by them. But since the expressions of divine significance which are predicated of God in holy scripture by transference from the creature to the creator, if, indeed, it is right to say that anything can be predicated of him, which must be considered in another place, are innumerable and cannot be found or gathered together within the small compass of our reasoning, only a few of the divine names can be set forth for the sake of example. Thus, God, is called essence, but strictly speaking he is not essence, for to being is opposed not being. Therefore he is. Υπερούσιος. That is, superessential. Again, he is called goodness, but strictly speaking he is not goodness, for to goodness wickedness is opposed. Therefore, he is. Υπεράγαθος. That is, more than good, and. Υπεραγαθότης. That is, more than goodness. He is called God, but he is not strictly speaking God, for to vision is opposed blindness, and to him who sees he who does not see. Therefore he is that is, more than God, for Theos is interpreted, he who sees. But if you have recourse to the alternative origin of this name, so that you understand Theos that is, God, to be derived not from the verb, that is, I see, but from the verb Theo that is, I run, the same reason confronts you. For to him who runs he who does not run is opposed, a slowness to speed. Therefore he will be υπέρθεος. That is, more than running, as it is written, his word runneth swiftly, for we understand this to refer to God the word, who in an ineffable way runs through all things that are, in order that they may be. We ought to think in the same way concerning truth, for to truth is opposed fossid, and therefore strictly speaking he is not truth. Therefore he is υπεραλήθης. And υπεραλήθεια. That is, more than true and, more than, truth. The same reason must be observed in all the divine names. For he is not called eternity properly, since to eternity is opposed temporality. Therefore he is υπεραιώνιος and υπεραιωνία. That is, more than eternal and, more than, eternity. Concerning wisdom also no other reason applies, and therefore it must not be thought that it is predicated of God properly, since against wisdom and the wise are set the fool and folly. Hence rightly and truly he is called Ipersophos. That is, more than wise, and Ipersophia. That is, more than wisdom. Similarly, he is more than life because to life is opposed death. Concerning light it must be understood in the same way, for against light is set darkness. For the present, as I think, enough has been said, concerning these, matters. It must indeed be admitted, that enough has been said. For the subject of our present debate does not allow us to say all that is necessary concerning such matters because of what must be discussed with a view to the business in hand. Return, therefore, if you please, to the consideration of the decad of the categories. I am surprised at the keenness of your attention which has been vigilant enough up to now. On what grounds, pray, do you say that? Did we not say that, strictly speaking, the ineffable nature can be signified by no verb, by no noun, and by no other audible sound, by no signified thing? And to this you agreed. For it is not properly but metaphorically that it is called essence, truth, wisdom, and other names of this sort. Rather, it is called superessential, more than truth, more than wisdom. But do not even these, names, seem to be, in a way, proper names? For if it is not called essence properly, yet it is properly called superessential. Similarly, if it is not called truth or wisdom properly, yet it is properly called more than truth and more than wisdom. It does not, therefore, lack names referring properly to it. For although among the Latins these names are not usually pronounced under a single accent or by a unitary harmony of composition, except the name superessentialis, by the Greeks, on the other hand, each is expressed by a single compound. 
for never, or scarcely ever, will you find, such compounds used in speeches are, super bonus, or super eternus and others like, them. I too wonder what I was thinking of when I let this important inquiry go ignored, and therefore I earnestly ask you to enter into it. For in whatever way the divine substance is spoken of, whether by simple parts of speech or by compounds, whether in Greek or in Latin, provided only it be a proper way, it will be seen that it is not ineffable. For that is not ineffable which can be spoken of in any way. Now you are on your guard, I see. Yes indeed. But so far this incidental question is anything but clear to me. Return, then, to the conclusion we reached a little earlier, for, unless I am mistaken, we said that there were two supreme branches of theology, and this we said not of ourselves but on the authority of Saint Dionysius the Areopagite, who very clearly, as has been said, asserts that theology is divided into two parts, that is, into Kataphatiki and Apophatiki which Cicero translates into intentio and repulsio, but we prefer to render by affirmation and negation with a view to expressing the meaning of the terms more accurately. I see that I do remember something of the sort, as I think. But I do not yet see how it helps us in the matter we now wish to consider. Do you not see that these two, namely affirmation and negation, are the opposites of one another? I am sufficiently aware of that, and I think there can be no greater contrariety. Attend, then, more carefully. For when you have reached the point of view of perfect reasoning you will see clearly enough that these two which seem to be the contraries of one another are in no way mutually opposed when they are applied to the divine nature, but in every way and at every point are in harmony with each other. And that this may become more evident we shall employ a few examples. For instance, Kataphatiki says, it is truth. Apophatiki contradicts, it is not truth. Here there appears some kind of contradiction, but a closer investigation reveals that there is no conflict. For that which says, it is truth, does not properly affirm that the divine substance is truth, but that it can be called by such a name by a transference of meaning from the creature to the creator, for, the divine essence being naked and stripped of every proper signification, it clothes it in such names as these. On the other hand, that which says, it is not truth, clearly understanding, as is right, that the divine nature is incomprehensible and ineffable, does not deny that it is, but, denies, that it can properly be called truth or properly be truth. For all the significations with which clothes the divinity are without fail stripped off it by. For the one, clothing it, says, for instance, it is wisdom, while the other, unclothing it, says, it is not wisdom. So the one says, it can be called this, but does not say, it properly is this, the other says, it is not this although it can be called after this. Unless I am mistaken, I fully understand this, and things which hitherto seem to me to be mutually contradictory are now seen as clear as day to agree with one another, and in no way, to dissent, when they are applied to God. But how this may lead to a solution of the present problem, I confess I do not yet see. Pay closer attention, then, and tell me, as far as you are able, to which branch of theology belong those significations which we previously introduced, I mean super-essential, more than truth, more than wisdom, and the others like them, that is to say, whether we should allocate them to the affirmative or to the negative theology. I am not so bold as to decide for myself. For when I see that the aforesaid significations like the negative particle, which means not, I fear to include them in the negative branch of theology, Yet if I include them in the affirmative branch I realize that I am not doing justice to their sense. For when it is said, it is super-essential, this can be understood by me as nothing else but a negation of essence. For he who says, it is super-essential, openly denies that it is essential, and therefore, although the negative is not expressed in the words pronounced, yet the hidden meaning of it is not hidden from those who consider them well. Indeed, as I think, I am compelled to admit that these aforesaid significations which in appearance do not imply a negation belong, as far as they can be understood, rather to the negative than to the affirmative branch of theology. I see that you have shown the greatest care and vigilance in your reply, and I strongly approve the way in which you have very subtly observed behind the outward expression of the affirmative branch the meaning of the negative. Let us then, if you agree, attempt a solution of the present problem as follows, that these names which are predicated of God by the addition of the particles super or more than, such as super essential, more than truth, more than wisdom, and the like, comprehend within themselves in the fullest sense the two previously mentioned branches of theology, so that in outward expression they possess the form of the affirmative, but in meaning the force of the negative. 
And let us conclude with this brief example, it is essence, affirmation, it is non-essence, negation, it is super-essential, affirmation and negation together, for superficially it lacks the negation, but is fully negative in meaning. For that which says, it is super-essential, says not what it is but what it is not, for it says that it is not essence but more than essence, but what that is which is more than essence it does not reveal. For it says that God is not one of the things that are but that he is more than the things that are, but what that is is, it in no way defines. We must not linger over this question any longer, I think. And now, if you agree, the nature of the categories must be considered. Aristotle, the shrewdest among the Greeks, as they say, in discovering the way of distinguishing natural things, included the innumerable variety of all things which come after God and are created by him in ten universal genera which he called the ten categories, that is, predicables. For, as he holds, nothing can be found in the multitude of created things and in the various motions of minds which cannot be included in one of these genera. Now, the Greeks call them. Ουσία ποσό τη ποιότη προ τη και είστε έξι, τόπο, χρόνο, πράτην, παθέιν. Which are called in Latin essentia, quantitas, qualitas, ad aliquid, situs, habitus, locus, tempus, adjury, pati. And of these ten genera there are innumerable subdivisions which our present task does not permit us to discuss lest we should digress too far from our topic, especially as it is the function of that branch of philosophy which is called dialectic to break down these genera into their subdivisions from the most general to the most specific, and to collect them together again from the most specific to the most general. But, as the Holy Father Augustine says in his books on the Trinity, when we come to theology, that is, to the study of the divine essence, the relevance of the categories is wholly extinguished. For if the force of any one of the categories whatsoever is effective in those natures which are created by God and in their motions, yet in that nature which can neither be spoken of nor understood it is throughout and in every respect ineffective, and yet, as we have said before, in the same way as almost all that is properly predicated of the nature of created things can be said metaphorically of their creator, so that some significant statement may be made, concerning him. So also what is signified by the categories, which strictly speaking can only be discerned in created things, can without absurdity be pronounced about the cause of all things, not to signify properly what it is, but to show by analogy what we, when in a certain manner inquiring about it, might, with probability, think about it. I clearly see that the categories can in no way be properly predicated of the ineffable nature, for if any one of the categories were to be properly predicated of God, it would necessarily follow that God is a genus. But God is neither genus nor species nor accident, therefore no category can properly signify God. Your view is correct. Not in vain, I think, was the trouble we have been willing to take over the two branches of theology. For we should not have been able so easily, and with hardly any difficulty at all, to arrive at this treatment of the categories, namely, that they cannot properly be predicated of God, had we not first satisfied ourselves that, in the case of the primordial causes which were established before all else by the one cause of all things, I mean essence, goodness, virtue, truth, wisdom, and the others of this sort, it is only metaphorically that they signify God. For if the created causes of all things which come first in order after it and which can only be apprehended by the perceptions of sheer mind fall short of the one ineffable cause of all things as regards excellence of essence, so that it can by no means be properly signified by their names, what are we to say of these aforementioned ten genera, which are discerned not only in intelligible things but also in sensible things? Surely it is not to be believed that they are truly and properly predicated of the divine and ineffable nature. I think so too. That it is, not to be believed. So it is not. Usia. Because it is more than. Usia. And yet it is called Omicron Sigma Alpha, because it is the creator of all. Usia. That is, of all essences. It is not quantity because it is more than quantity. For every quantity extends in three dimensions length, breadth, and depth. And these three dimensions are again produced in six directions, for length goes up and down, breadth to the right and to the left, depth forwards and backwards. But there is no dimension in God, therefore there is in him no quantity. Moreover quantity consists in the number of parts, either naturally continuous as in the case of a line or of time, or naturally discontinuous, as in that of corporeal or intelligible numbers, the divine substance is neither composed of continuous parts nor divisible into separate parts. Therefore it is not a quantity. And yet it may not inappropriately be called quantity in two ways, 
either because quantity is often used in the sense of abundance of power, or because it is the origin and cause of all quantity. Concerning quality also we must think in the same way, for God is no quality, no quality is an accident to him, in no quality does he participate. And yet quality is very often predicated of him, either because he is the creator of all quality, or because quality is very frequently used in reference to the virtues. For goodness as well as justice and the other virtues are often called qualities. But God is virtue and more than virtue. The principle of relation is not as patently obvious as are the definitions of the other categories. For it appears to be the only category which is, so to say, properly predicable of God, and for this reason I see that we must inquire with the utmost care whether in the most high and holy trinity of the three supreme substances Father is properly said in relation to the Son, similarly Son, in relation to the Father. And Holy Spirit, in relation to the Father and the Son because the Spirit is of both for that these are the names of conditions St. Gregory the theologian asserts in a manner not to be doubted, or whether here again, as in the case of the other categories, this one also, which is called relation or condition, must be believed and understood to be predicated of God metaphorically. Your method of inquiring into the mystery of truth is a reasonable one, as I think. For it does seem as if none of the categories except this one alone is properly predicated of God. But whether this is really so or not must be examined with the utmost reverence and care. For if it is properly predicated of God, almost all our previous reasoning will be undermined. For we asserted that nothing at all can properly be said or understood of God. Indeed, the category of relation will not be reckoned among the ten genera of the categories if it is properly predicated of God. But if this is found to be the case the number of the categories will not be ten but nine. Therefore there is no course left open to us but to understand that this category too, as well as the others, is predicated of God metaphorically, for to this we are prompted and urged by sound reasoning lest what has already been said should begin to appear uncertain. For why, is it contrary to sound reasoning if we say that, Father, and Son, are names for that condition which is called, in relation to something, and for what is more than condition? For the same condition is not to be believed in the most exalted substances of the divine essence and in those which were created after it and by it. For, if I am not mistaken, just as it surpasses every essence, wisdom, and virtue, so also in an ineffable manner it goes beyond every condition. For who would believe that there is the same kind of condition between the Father and His Word as there can be observed between Abraham and Isaac? For the latter condition, being of the flesh and resulting from the division of nature after the sin of the first man, is found, on inquiry, to consist in the multiplication by generation, in the former case it is believed and, in so far as it is revealed by the radiance of the divine light, known to be an ineffable bond uniting the unbegotten and the begotten substances. In the latter case what is under consideration did not proceed from nature but from transgression, in the former, what is contemplated is known to proceed from the ineffable fertility of the divine goodness. But let us pass on to other categories. There are six left, unless I am mistaken, of which the first is. Kiste. That is, to lie, which others call situation. Now situation means the posture of a creature, whether visible or invisible. For instance, it is said of some body either, it lies, or, it stands, similarly it is said of the mind if it is at rest, it lies, if it is alert, it stands, because standing is usually applied to this category, for motion is related to time. But because God neither stands nor lies the aforesaid category can in no way be predicated of God. And yet, since he is the cause of standing, and of lying for in him all things both stand, that is, subsist immutably in their reasons, and lie, that is, find their rest, because he is the end of all things, beyond which there is nothing for them to strive for, to lie or situation can be predicated of him metaphorically. For if God truly and properly lies or sits or stands he does not lack posture, if he does not lack posture he occupies place. But he does not occupy place, therefore he is not contained within any situation. I clearly see what you mean, and therefore I see fit that we should pass on to the category of condition, which seems to be the most obscure of all the categories because of its excessive range. For there is scarcely any category in which some condition is not found. For even essences or substances stand in regard to one another in respect of some condition. For we state in what proportion, that is condition, rational and irrational essence stand to one another, for the irrational could not be so called but for its condition of absence of reason, as the rational is not so called save from its condition of the presence of reason. 
for every proportion is a condition although not every condition is a proportion, because properly speaking proportion can only be found where there are at least two terms, while condition is found in single things also. For instance, the condition of the rational soul is virtue. So proportion is some species of condition. But if you wish it to be made clear by an example how the condition of proportion is found in essence, take the case of numbers. For numbers, as I think, are understood to be present in all things as their essence. For it is in numbers that the essence of all things subsists. Do you see, then, what kind of proportion there is between two and three? Yes, certainly. I think it is the proportion of two-thirds, and from this one example I can get to know the various kinds of proportion of all the other substantial numbers when they are brought into relation with each other. Turn your attention, then, to the rest, of the categories, and learn that there are no species of quantity, or of quality, or of that which is called in relation to something, or of situation, or of place, or of time, or of action, or of passion, in which some kind of condition is not found. I have often searched into such matters and have found it to be so. For, to make use of a few examples, in quantities when the great and the small and the medium-sized are compared, condition is plainly evident. Also in the quantities of numbers, distances, durations of time, and other similar things, you will clearly find the condition of proportion. Similarly in quality. For instance in colors, white and black and whatever intermediate color there may be, are related to each other by condition, for white and black, because they occupy extreme positions in the range of colors, stand in regard to one another in the condition of contrariety, while the range of color stands in regard to its extremes, white, I mean, and black, in the condition of intermediacy. Also, in that category which is called Prosti. That is, in relation to something, condition, is much in evidence, as the condition of father to son or son to father, of friend to friend, of double to single, and other instances of this sort. In the case of situation too it is easily seen how standing and lying possess a condition in respect of one another, for they are diametrically opposed to one another. For you will certainly never form a notion of standing distinct from the notion of lying, but the two always occur to you together, although they do not appear together in any one thing. What is to be said of place, when the higher and the lower and the intermediate are considered? Do they lack condition? By no means, for these names do not proceed out of the nature of things but from the point of view of one who observes them part by part. For there is no up and down in the universe, and therefore in the universe there is nothing either higher or lower or intermediate. These, notions, are rejected by a consideration of the whole, but introduced by attention to the parts. The same thing applies to the greater and the less, for nothing in its own genus can be either small or great, but such concepts have been formed by the thought of those who compare differing quantities, and therefore the condition is brought about in them by the consideration of spaces or of parts. For no nature would be either greater or smaller than any other nature, just as none is either higher or lower, since the nature by which all subsist is one, being the creation of one God. What of time? When times are compared with one another, does not condition come clearly into view in them? For instance, days compared to hours, hours to minutes, minutes to the moment, moments to indivisible units? Much the same one will find in the higher units of time if one ascends there. For in all these is seen the condition of the whole to the parts, and of the parts to the whole. Assuredly it is not otherwise. And how, is it, in the diverse motions of action and passion? Is not condition everywhere in evidence? For to love and to be loved are conditions of the lover, and the beloved since they are reciprocal to one another whether they occur in a single person, which is called by the Greeks. Autopathia. That is, when action and passion are observed in one and the same person, as I love myself, or between two persons, which is called by the Greeks. Eteropathia. That is, when the lover is one person and the beloved is another, as I love you. This too I see to be true. I ask you therefore why this category of condition, since it seems to be naturally inherent in all the other categories, has its own place as a species by itself in the decad of the categories, as though founded upon its own proper reasons. Is it perhaps for the very reason that it is found in all that it subsists in itself? For that which is of all belongs properly to none, but is in all in such a way as to subsist in itself. For the same may be observed also in the category of essence. 
consider, although there are ten categories, is not one of them called essence or substance, while nine are accidents subsisting in the substance. For they cannot subsist by themselves. Essence appears to be in all, for without it they are not able to be. And yet, it occupies a place of its own, for that which is of all is proper to none but common to all, and while it subsists in all it does not cease to be in itself, according to its proper reason. The same may be said of quantity. For we say, what quantity of essence? What quantity of quality? What quantity of relation? What quantity of situation? What quantity of condition? How great a place? How small or how great an extent of time? What quantity of action? What quantity of passion? Do you see how extensively quantity is applied to the other categories? And yet it does not cease to hold its own place. What of quality? Is it not usual for this to be frequently predicated of all the other categories? For we say, what quality of? Usia. What quality of size? What quality of relation, situation, condition, place, time, action, passion? For we ask in respect of all these what is their quality? And yet quality does not abandon the reason of its proper genus. What, then, is strange if the category of condition, while it is observed in all, is said to possess its own reason? It is not to be considered strange at all. For right reason convinces us that it cannot be otherwise. Do you not then see that the divine essence does not participate in any condition, and that nevertheless condition can be not unsuitably predicated of it since, the divine essence, is its cause? For if condition were predicated of it properly, the divine essence, would not be of itself but of another. For every condition is understood to be in some subject and to be the accident of something, which it is impious to believe of God, to whom nothing is an accident, and who is not an accident to anything, and who is not comprehended in anything, nor anything in him. Enough has been said of this category, as I think. What then? For the remaining categories can we not briefly summarize from what has been said before? For God is neither place nor time, and yet metaphorically he is called the place and time of all things because he is the cause of all places and all times. For the definitions of all things subsist in him as places, as it were, and from him as from a certain moment of time, through him as through a certain period of time, and, towards him as towards the end, as it were, of times, the motion of all things both begins and moves and comes to an end, although he himself neither moves himself nor is moved by himself or by another. Consider, if he were properly called place and time would it not appear that he would not be outside all things on account of the excellence of his essence, but be included in the number of all the things that are. For place and time are counted among all the things that have been created. For in these two the whole of the world that now exists is comprised and, they are that, without which it cannot exist, and therefore they are called by the Greeks. Onanevtopan. That is, without which the universe cannot exist. For everything that is in the world must move in time and be defined in place, even place itself is defined and time itself moves. But God neither moves nor is defined. For, he is, the place of places by which all places are defined, and, since he is not fixed in place by anything but gives place to all things within him, he is not place but more than place. For he is defined by nothing, but defines all things, therefore he is the cause of all things. In the same way, the cause of times moves the times, but itself is not moved by any time in any time, for it is more than time and more than motion. Therefore he is neither place nor time. Your words are so plain, clearer even than daylight, that enough already seems to have been said now on the nature of the categories, and about their metaphorical use for denoting the divine essence, in view of the further demands of our present task. Of these ten genera four are at rest, that is. Usia. Quantity, situation, place, while, six are in motion, quality, relation, condition, time, action, passion, and I do not think you are unaware of this. Yes, this is clear to me, and I have no more questions to ask about it. But what follows from this? That you should plainly understand that the ten genera already mentioned are comprised within two higher and more general genera, namely motion and rest, which again are gathered into that most general genus which is usually called by the Greeks. Topan. But by our writers of Niuersitas. This I much welcome because of those who think that there cannot be found in the nature of things any more general genus to precede the ten already mentioned genera which were discovered and named by Aristotle. Does then this division of the categories, into those, in motion and, those, at rest, 
that is, four at rest, six in motion, seem to you correct? Yes, except that I am still not sufficiently clear about two, I mean, condition and relation. For these two categories seem to me to be rather at rest than in motion. For whatever has attained to its proper condition remains immutable, for if it were to move in any way it would clearly be no longer a condition. For virtue in the soul is only then truly a condition of the mind when it abides in it immutably so that it cannot be separated from it. And that is the reason why no true condition is found in bodies, for the armed or the clothed man can be deprived of his armor or his clothing. In relation also rest is thought to prevail. For the relation of father to son or of double to single, and vice versa, is unalterable. For a father is always the father, of his son, just as a son, is always the son of his father, and so forth. Perhaps you would not have hesitated much, over this, if you had been more careful to notice that everything which does not perfectly inhere in a creature so as to be of one nature with it but proceeds by certain increases to its perfection which cannot be separated from it and which cannot change must be in motion. But every condition is an ascending motion towards perfection in that of which it is the condition. But who would presume to be assured of perfection in this life? Therefore condition is in motion. Concerning relation also your hesitation is surprising to me, since you see that it cannot exist in one and the same subject, for it always appears in two. But that the mutual attraction of two subjects is the effect of some sort of motion who would doubt? There is also another way in which things in motion are very clearly distinguished from things at rest, to say no more for the moment of that most general principle by which all things created by God after God are shown to be in motion, for all things move through the process of generation from the state of non-existence into the state of existence, for the divine goodness summons all things out of not being into being so that they are, created, out of nothing, and each one of the things that are is moved by a natural desire towards its own essence and genus and species and individuality, we properly say that those things are at rest which subsist by themselves and have no need of any subject, in order that they may be, while those things which exist in something because they cannot exist by themselves we not inappropriately judge to be in motion. Thus, condition and relation are in some subject, and strive by a natural motion to be in it always, because without it they cannot exist. Therefore they are in motion. Then what shall we say of place, of quantity, of situation, which you have said among the things that are at rest? For concerning Usia. That is, essence, no one doubts, but that it does not require anything in order to subsist, for it is upon it that all the rest are supported. But these, I mean place and quantity and situation, are counted among the accidents of essence, and therefore are moved by desire for the subject in which they are and without which they cannot be. And if this is the case, all are in motion save Usia. which alone is without movement except for that by which all things strive towards being since it alone subsists by itself. Your question is not altogether ridiculous for you follow the common opinion. But if you look more closely you will find that place is not contained by anything but contains all things that are placed in it. For if place is nothing else but the limit and definition of every finite nature, then surely place does not strive to be in something, but all things which are in it are rightly always seeking it as their limit and their end, in which it is of their nature to be contained and without which it is understood that they would melt away into infinity. Therefore place is not in motion, since all that is in place moves towards it, but it itself is at rest. Concerning quantity and situation reason teaches the same. For what does everything which partakes of quantity or position, whether sensible or intelligible, strive for if not that it may attain to its own perfect quantity and position, that there it may find its rest? Therefore they do not seek but are sought after, therefore they are not in motion, therefore they are at rest. Are we then to say that these three, quantity, situation, place, are accidents of Usia. or that they are substances in their own right? I see that this too is worthy of inquiry. For according to the opinion of the dialecticians everything that is is either a subject, or what is predicated of a subject, or what is in a subject, or what is predicated of an is in a subject. But if right reason is consulted it replies that subject, and what is predicated of a subject are one, and differ in no respect. For if, as they say, Cicero is a subject and first substance, while man is predicated of the subject and second substance, what difference in regard of nature is there except that the one is in the individual while the other is in the species, since species is nothing else but the unity of the individuals and number nothing else but the plurality of the species? 
If then the species is total and one and indivisible in the individuals and the individuals are an indivisible unity in the species, what difference there is in respect of nature between subject and what is predicated of a subject I do not see. The same must be understood concerning the accidents of the first substance, for what is in the subject is not other than what is at the same time in and predicated of the subject. Thus, art, to take an example, is one and the same thing in itself and in its species and in its individuals. Therefore the art of each particular thing, which is called by the dialectician simply, that which is in the subject, is not other than art in general, which is called by the same persons, that which is in the subject and predicated of the subject, since, while it subsists in the subject, that is, in the first substance, it is predicated of the subject, that is, of the art that is proper of something, but in its whole and in its parts it is one and the same thing. And so there are left subject, and what is in a subject, but if you look more carefully, taking Saint Gregory the theologian and his, most wise, commentator Maximus as your guides, you will find that in all things that are. Usia. Is in itself wholly incomprehensible not only to the sense but also to the intellect, and therefore that it is known to exist, only, from these circumstances, as we may call them, by which I mean place, quantity, situation, to which is also added time. For within these, as within certain boundaries which have been placed about it, essence is known to be enclosed, so that they seem neither to be accidents to it as though subsisting in it, for they are outside it, nor to be able to exist without it, since it is the center of the revolutions of time and dispositions of place, quantities, and situation. Therefore some of the categories are predicated around, which are said to be a kind of Periohie. that is, circumstances, because they are seen to be about it, while some, which are called by the Greeks. Συμβάματα. That is, accidents, are within it, quality, relation, condition, action and passion. And these are understood also outside it, in other categories, for example, quality in quantity, as color in a body, also, quality in. Ουσία. As invisibility and incomprehensibility in genera, also, relation outside, father to son, son to father, for these are not of nature but of the transitory process of generation which is an accident of their bodies. For the father is father not of the nature of the son nor is the son son of the father's nature, for father and son are of one and the same nature. But no nature begets itself or is begotten of itself. There is, however, relation even within. Usia. When genus is related to species and species to genus. For genus is the genus of species and species is the species of genus. Condition also is found both outside. Usia. And within, as, with regard to the body, we say that, a person, is armed or clothed. But the condition of Usia is the unchangeable virtue of genus and species by which the genus even when it is divided into species still remains one and indivisible in itself and subsists as a whole in each species, and all its separate species form a single whole in it. The same virtue is also seen in the species, which, even when it is divided among individuals, preserves undiminished the force of its own indivisible unity, and all the individuals into which it appears to be infinitely divided are in it finite and an indivisible unity. But concerning action and passion no one is in doubt, for we see that bodies, although they belong to quantity, both act and suffer. Also the genera and species of Usia itself when they multiply into diverse species and individuals are seen to act. But if a man should by exercising his reason in accordance with that art which is called Analytiki Unite, by gathering them together, the individuals into their species and the species into their genera and the genera into Usia They are said to suffer, not that he himself gathers them, for they are gathered, as also divided, by nature, but because he seems to gather them by an act of his reason, for when he divides them he is also said to act, while they are said to suffer. Although these things appear to be obscure they do not so completely elude my mind that nothing in them is revealed clearly and distinctly, and since I see that almost all the categories are so interrelated that they can scarcely be distinguished from one another in a definite way for they all, as it seems to me, appear to be involved in one another I urge you to show in what property each can be found. How does it seem to you? Is. Usia. Holy, and properly, contained within the most general genera and in the more general genera as well as in the genera themselves and in their species and again in those most special species which are called atoms, that is, individuals? I see that there is nothing else in which. Usia. 
can be naturally present except in the genera and species which extend from the highest down to the lowest, that is, from the most general to the most special, that is, the individuals, and up again from the individuals to the most general genera. For in these, as it were in its natural parts, it subsists as a whole. Go on to the remainder then. Does the property of quantity seem to you to exist anywhere but in the number of the parts, or in their spaces, or in their measures, whether those parts be continuous as other parts of lines or of times and of other things which are held together by continuous quantity, or are discontinuous, being marked off by definite natural limits as are numbers and every multitude, in which it is clear that there is discontinuous quantity? This too is clearly apparent. And does that which is called quality properly reside anywhere but in shapes and surfaces, either in natural bodies or in geometrical bodies such as plain figures like triangles, rectangles, polygons, and circles, and also in those of solid structure, such as cubes, cones, and spheres? For solid bodies, whether natural or geometrical, when they are inwardly investigated for the spaces which they occupy, I mean length, breadth, and depth, are allotted to quantity, but when their surface is considered, they belong to quality. Is it not also prominent in incorporeal things, seeing that all arts and virtues, whether they be rational or irrational, as long as they have not yet attained to the immutable stability of the mind, are referred to it? Go on to the remainder. For this I clearly see, and agree that it is so. And does that which is called by the Greeks? Pros. But by us, with regard to something or relation, properly occupy any other place in nature than in the proportions of things or numbers, and in the indissoluble ties which exist between those things which stand in regard to one another so that when the one is spoken of the meaning is understood not from itself but from the other which is opposed to it. Of this indisruptible affinity and inseparable bond examples are provided by the multiple numbers, which are linked to one another, the double, the triple, the quadruple, and others of the sort up to infinity, and also by fractions such as three halves, four quarters, five quarters and others of this kind, in all of which not only the integers exhibit various proportions when compared with one another, but also the parts of individual numbers, brought into conjunction with one another are inseparably linked by the ratios of their proportions, and this you will find not only in the terms of numbers themselves but also in the proportions of proportions which the arithmeticians call proportionalities. I am not ignorant of this either, for these things are well known to those who are skilled in the arts. What is to be said of situation? Does it not have its proper place in the natural or artificial distributions of corporeal things or in the dispositions of spiritual things? For when I say first, second, third, and the next, whether in the case of wholes, or parts, or genera, or species, is it not the situation of each that I have in mind? Again, if I say to the right, to the left, upwards, downwards, forwards, backwards, what else do I indicate but a position either of the whole world in general or of its parts? For he who says of a body, it lies, or it sits, or it stands, means nothing else than that it is lying down or is standing up or is suspended in a kind of balance between up and down. Also, if someone says such things of the mind he will seem to mean nothing else than that it is still lying prone under the passions of sins, or is making some effort to get free from them, or has perfectly risen to the virtues. This does not seem so difficult to understand either. Go on to the rest. Next, I think, comes condition, which is most clearly seen in the certain possession of virtues or of vices. For every art, that is, every motion of the rational or irrational mind, once it has attained to a fixed state so that it cannot in any way on any occasion be moved from it but always adheres to the mind so that it seems to be one with the mind itself is called a condition, and therefore every perfected virtue which is inseparably fixed in the mind is truly and properly called a condition. In the same way, in bodies in which nothing stable is to be seen, condition, strictly speaking, is hardly, if ever, to be found, for to call that a condition which is not possessed all the time though it appears to be possessed for some of the time will be a misuse of the term. Go on to the rest, for no one denies that this is likely to be so. Next comes place, which, as we just said, is constituted in the definitions of things that can be defined. For place is nothing else but the boundary by which each is enclosed within fixed terms. But of places there are many kinds, for there are as many places as there are things which can be bounded, whether these be corporeal or incorporeal. For instance, body is a compound welded together, if the qualities, of the four elements under a single species, for by this definition all bodies which consist of matter and form are included in one general description. 
Also, spirit is an incorporeal nature without form or matter in itself, for every spirit that is either rational or intellectual is by itself formless, but if it turns towards its cause, that is, to the word, by whom all things are made, then it takes on form. Therefore the one form of all rational and intellectual spirits is the word of God. But if the spirit is irrational it is equally formless in itself, but it takes form from the fantasies of sensible things. Therefore the form of all irrational spirits is the fantasy of corporeal things implanted in their memory by means of the corporeal senses. Among the liberal arts also very many definitions are found, for there is no art without its definitions, as there are the dialectical definitions from genus, from species, from name, a priori, a posteriori, from contraries, and other definitions of this kind, which there is no time to discuss now. For the dialectical definitions extend over so wide a field that from wherever in the nature of things the dialectical mind finds an argument which establishes a doubtful matter it describes the s of the argument, or the seat of the argument, as a place. You will find the same thing in the other arts, which are bounded by their places, that is, by their proper definitions, of which the following are examples, grammar is the art which protects and controls articulate speech. Rhetoric is the art which carries out a full and elaborate examination of a set topic under the headings of person, matter, occasion, quality, place, time, and opportunity, and can be briefly defined, rhetoric is the art which deals acutely and fully with a topic defined by its seven circumstances. Dialectic is the art which diligently investigates the rational common concepts of the mind. Arithmetic is the reasoned and pure art of the numbers which come under the contemplations of the mind. Geometry is the art which considers by the mind's acute observation the intervals and surfaces of plane and solid figures. Music is the art which by the light of reason studies the harmony of all things that are in motion that is knowable by natural proportions. Astronomy is the art which investigates the dimensions of the heavenly bodies and their motions and their returnings at fixed times. These are the general definitions of the liberal arts, these the terms within which they are contained. But inside these definitions there are innumerable others. By these arguments I am forced to confess that place exists in the mind alone. For if every definition is in art and every art is in definitions of the art's mind, every place, since place is definition, will necessarily be nowhere else, but in the mind. You observe correctly. Then what must be said of those who declare that the habitations of men and the other animals are places, who similarly consider that this common air, and also the earth, are the places of all who dwell in them, who say that water is the place of the fishes, who think the ether is the place of the planets, the sphere of heaven that of the stars? Nothing but to persuade them, of their error, if they are teachable, and wish to be taught, or if they are stubborn, to disregard them entirely. For right reason laughs at people who say such things. For if body is a different thing from place it follows that place is not a body. But the air is the fourth part of this corporeal and visible world, therefore it is not a place. For it is agreed that this visible world is composed of the four elements as of four general parts, and is, as it were, a body built up of its parts, from which, namely from these universal parts, coming together in a wonderful and ineffable mingling, the proper and individual bodies of all animals, trees, and plants are composed, and at the time of their dissolution return to them once more. For as this sensible world as a whole rotates with unceasing motion about its pivot, I mean earth, about which, as about a kind of center, the other three elements, namely, water, air, fire, spin in unceasing rotation, so by an invisible motion which is never interrupted the universal bodies, I mean the four elements, coming together compose the particular bodies of individual things, which at their dissolution return again from particular bodies to universal bodies, although their will always remain without change, like a center, the natural essence which is proper to each individual, which can neither move nor increase nor diminish. For it is the accidents that are in motion, not the essence, nor is it even the accidents themselves that are in motion either by increase, or by decrease, but it is the participation of them by essence that undergo such changes. For right reason does not allow it to be otherwise, for every nature, whether of the essences or of their accidents, is immutable, but, as we said, the participation of the essences by the accidents or of the accidents by the essences is perpetually in motion. For participation can have a beginning and increase and decrease, until this world attains its end in the stability in all things, after which neither essence nor accident nor their participation of one another will suffer any motion, for all will be the immovable self-identical one when all things shall have returned to their immutable reasons. But I think I must discuss this return in another place.
but the reason why only the center of the world, that is, Earth, is always at rest, while the remainder of the elements revolve about it in eternal motion, demands a thorough inquiry. For we know the opinions both of the pagan philosophers and of the Catholic fathers on this question. For Plato, the greatest of those who philosophized about the world, gives in his Timius many reasons for asserting that this visible world is composed of body and soul like some vast animal, and the body of this animal is compacted of the four well-known and general elements and of the various bodies which are made from them, while its soul is a universal life principle which animates and sets in motion all things which are in motion or at rest. Hence the poet, to begin with, the spirit within nourishes the sky and the earth and the watery wastes, the shining globe of the moon and the star of Titan. But because the soul itself, as he says, is eternally in motion, for the purpose of giving life to its body, that is, to the whole world, and of ruling it, and of imparting movement to it by bringing together and separating again in various ways the diverse particular bodies, and yet keeps to its own natural and unchanging state, it is, therefore, ever in motion and ever at rest. And thus its body also, that is, the universe of visible things, is partially at rest in eternal stability, as is earth, and partially, moving, with eternal velocity, as is the ethereal region, partially neither at rest nor moving with velocity, as water, partially moving with velocity but not with maximum velocity, as is the case with air. And this theory of the excellent philosopher is not to be despised, as I think, for it seems to be ingenious and true to nature. But since Gregory, the great bishop of Nyssa, reasons very subtly about the same matter, in his treatise, On the Image, I think we had better follow his opinion. For he says that the founder of the universe established this visible world between two extremes which are the contraries of one another, I mean between heaviness and lightness, which are absolutely opposed to each other, and therefore, since earth is established in heaviness it remains always without motion, for heaviness cannot move, and is set in the center of the world, and occupies the extreme, and innermost, boundary while the ethereal regions always revolve with indescribable speed. About the center for the reason that they are constituted in the nature of lightness, which cannot be at rest, and occupy the extreme boundary of the visible world, but the two elements which are constituted between, namely, water and air, have a ceaseless movement proportionately moderated between heaviness and lightness, so, that, each, follows more closely the limit which is nearest to it than that which is remote from it. For water moves more slowly than air because it adheres to the heaviness of earth, while air is in more rapid motion than water because it is adjacent to the lightness of ether. But although the extreme parts of the world seem to oppose one another on account of the diversity of their qualities, yet they are not in all things in disagreement, for although the ethereal regions perpetually revolve with the utmost velocity, nevertheless the chorus of the stars maintains its immutable station so that it both revolves with the ether and keeps its natural place with a stability that resembles that of earth. While, on the other hand, although earth is eternally at rest, all things that originate from it are in an eternal motion which resembles that of the lightness of the ether, in coming to birth through generation, increasing into the number of places and times, and then again decreasing and coming to the point where form and matter fall apart. You seem to have been led rather too far away from the main question by an incidental one, for whereas it was our intention to speak about place, you have abandoned place and turned aside to treat of the world, and where this is leading I do not know. To no other end but that we should distinguish by careful reasoning between the nature of bodies and the nature of places, for confusion between these is the principal, if not the sole, cause of error to many, if not all, of those who hold this visible world, and its parts both general and particular, to be places. For if, in the light of right reason, they were to distinguish the genera of all things accurately and correctly, they would never include body and place in the same genus. For none of those who rightly consider and distinguish the natures of things confuses places and bodies in a single genus, but separates them by a rational distinction. For bodies are included in the category of quantity, but the category of quantity differs widely by nature from the category of place. Therefore body is not place since a locality is not a quantity, for, as we said before, quantity is nothing else but the definite measuring out of parts which are separated either by the reason alone or by natural differentiation, and the rational extension to definite limits of those things which extend in the dimensions of nature, I mean in length, in breadth, and in depth, while place is nothing else but the boundary and enclosure of things which are contained within a fixed limit. Therefore if this world is a body it necessarily follows that its parts are bodies too. But if they are bodies they belong to the genus of quantity, not to that of locality. But they are bodies, therefore they are not places. Do you then see how it is concluded from the foregoing arguments that this world with its parts is not a place but is contained within place, that is, within the fixed limit of its definition? 
For that which contains is one thing and that which is contained is another. Bodies are contained in their places, therefore body is one thing and place another, just as the quantity of parts is one thing, their definition another. Therefore those four well-known elements are not places but are enclosed in places, for they are the principal parts which between them make up the totality of the sensible world. What has been said by you concerning the difference between places and bodies seems most likely to be true, but I should like you to go over it again in more detail. For I do not see why this world is not a place when many things are placed in it. You are aware, I think, of the fact that none of the aforesaid ten categories which Aristotle defined, when thought of by itself, that is, in its own nature, in the light of reason, is accessible to the bodily senses. 4. Usia is incorporeal and the object of no sense, while the other nine categories are about it or within it. But if the former is incorporeal, surely it must be apparent to you that everything which is either attached to it or subsists in it and cannot exist apart from it is incorporeal. Therefore, all the categories are incorporeal when considered in themselves. Some of them, however, by a certain marvellous commingling with one another, as Gregory says, produce visible matter, while some appear in nothing and remain forever incorporeal. 4. Usia. And relation, place, time, action, passion are not reached by any bodily sense, while quantity and quality, situation and condition, when they come together and constitute matter, as we said just now, are normally perceived by bodily sense. If, then, place is normally counted among those things which are by no means accessible to the bodily senses, while bodies, if not perceived by the senses, are not bodies, does that not prove that, place, is, not, a body? I am speaking here of the bodies that are produced by the coming together of the four elements of the world. For the four elements of the world, although they are discrete bodies in themselves, yet because of the indescribable fineness and purity of their nature, surpass all mortal sense. Therefore place is one thing and body another. Or does it seem to you otherwise? By no means. And this latest conclusion of our reasoning excludes all possibility of allowing that place and body are of a single genus. But that which I notice you have added incidentally, that visible matter combined with form for whatever becomes manifest becomes manifest through form is nothing else but a concourse of certain accidents, troubles me not a little. Let it not do so. For, as I have said, the great Gregory of Nyssa in his homily on the image proves it to be so by reasons beyond doubt, saying that matter is nothing else but a certain composition of accidents which proceeds from invisible causes to visible matter. Not unreasonably, for if in this corporeal, and dissoluble, matter there should be any simple, immutable, and quite indissoluble essence, then it could not be wholly dissolved by any thought, or action. But in fact it is dissolved, therefore there is nothing in it which is indissoluble. For genera and species and atoma are eternal and endure for the very reason that there is in them something which is one and indivisible which can neither be dissolved nor destroyed. Also, the accidents themselves remain without change in their own natures for the reason that underlying them all there is something indivisible in which they all naturally subsist as one. Nothing is more true, in my opinion, and therefore I am waiting for you to bring the present inquiry to a close. What remains but to say that when, for instance, we see that our bodies are placed on this earth or surrounded by this air, they are simply bodies within bodies. For the same reason the fish in the sea, the planets in the ether, the stars in the firmament, are bodies within bodies, lesser within greater ones, grosser within finer, light ones within lighter, pure within purer. For true reason teaches that all these things, sensible as well as intelligible, are contained within their proper places, that is, in their natural definitions. I do not dispute this conclusion either, for I perceive it to be true. But I wonder very much why the custom has come into common usage in everyday life of saying that all these bodies, whether of heaven or of air or of water or of earth, are the places of the lesser bodies within them, and similarly of holding that, Usia. is nothing else but this visible and tangible body, and therefore I earnestly pray that it may not be tedious for you to prolong further the discussion of this present problem. Why, then, we have, have we not, already agreed that all things that are known by bodily sense or reason or intellect can justly be predicated of God because he is the creator of them all, although a pure contemplation of the truth establishes the fact that, he, is none of the things that are predicated of him. Reason teaches that this is undeniable, and it is clearer than day. If therefore it is just a predicate of God all things that are, not indeed properly, 
but by a kind of metaphor because they derive from him, what is strange if all things which are in place, because everywhere they are seen to be enclosed in things greater than themselves, can be called places, although none of them is strictly speaking a place but is contained within the place, of its proper nature, and although we see that it is by metonomia, that is, by a transference of name, that those things which are contained are called after the things which contain them, although they are not contained by them in such a way that without them they could not subsist within their natural limits. For the common usage of mortals usually calls the wife or the family a house, although by nature the two notions are distinct, for it is not the house which confers on wife or family their substantial being, but the place of their nature. But because it is in it that they possess, their substantial being, they are customarily called after it, and similarly the things that contain, are called, after the things that are contained by them. For example, air contains light, and therefore air filled with light is called light, the eye is called sight or vision although in respect of the property of its nature it is neither sight nor vision. For who does not know that the eye is a corporeal part of the head and that it is moist, and that it is that through which the sight pours forth from the brain like rays out of the meanings, that is, membrane. The meanings, however, receives the nature of light from the heart, that is, from the seat of fire. For sight is the emission of natural light in the sense of seeing of him who possesses it, bursting forth in the manner of rays, which, when it surrounds the colors and forms of sensible bodies without, with marvelous swiftness takes on the form of those colored visible shapes. For vision is an image, formed in the rays of the eyes, of the shapes and colors of bodies, which with no intervening delay is seized by the sense and implanted in the memory of the percipient. It is the same with the sense of the ears. For that part of the head which is properly called ear is also called after hearing because it is the instrument of hearing, and so it is for a thousand, other examples, of this kind. This too I plainly perceive. Do you then see that it is by custom and for the necessity of having something significant to say about things that humanity, incapable of distinguishing the things that truly are, has devised these misleading names for them, calling the lowest and central part of the visible world, I mean earth, the place of animals that walk? Similarly to this it calls the part that is adjacent to it and inseparable from it, and closest to it by the quality of coldness, I mean water, the place of all, animals, that swim, and then it considers the part of the world that comes third in the natural order to be the place of the winged species. And in the same way it customarily names the immense spaces of the ether the places of the celestial bodies which revolve about it in circular motion, all of which, if studied according to the true reason of the distinction of natures, are seen to be not places but parts of the world enclosed within their places. But in order that you may clearly know that these aforesaid general parts of the world and the parts of those parts down to the smallest divisions are not places but are enclosed within places, the nature of place itself must be considered a little more carefully, if you agree. Certainly I agree, and I am burning with zeal to hear this. Take then, to start with, this kind of reasoning, which we have taken over from the Holy Fathers, namely from Gregory the Theologian and the excellent commentator of his homilies, Maximus, everything that is, except God who alone properly subsists above being itself, is understood to be in place, with which, namely with place, time is always and in every way simultaneously understood. For it is impossible to conceive place if time is withdrawn, as it is impossible for time to be defined without understanding it in connection with place. For these are included among the things which are always found inseparably together, and without these no essence which has received being through generation can by any means exist or be known. Therefore the essence of all existing things is local and temporal, and thus it can in no way be known except in place and time and under place and time. For the universe of all things is not under itself or within itself, for it is irrational and impossible to make a statement to this effect, namely, that the universe itself is above the totality of itself, when, in fact, it is defined by the ultimate causative power, which is beyond everything and defines everything, under itself in itself. The place of the universe, then, is its outer limit, according to the definition some give to place, saying, place is the boundary outside the universe, or its very position outside the universe, or the comprehensive limit in which that which is comprehended is comprehended. Again, all things will be shown to be under time by the fact that all things which possess being after God do not possess it simply but after some manner, and therefore are not without a beginning. For everything which receives the reason of essence after some manner, although it is, yet was not. Therefore to be after some manner, this is to be in place, and beginning after some manner to be, this is to be in time. And therefore since everything that is, except God, subsists after some manner and has begun to subsist through generation, it is necessarily enclosed within place and time. 
Hence, when we say that God is, we do not say that he is after some manner, and, therefore we use the words is and was in him simply and infinitely and absolutely. For the divine is incomprehensible to all reason and all intellect, and therefore when we predicate being of him we do not say that he is, for being is from him but he is not himself being. For above this being after some manner there is more than being, an absolute being beyond language and understanding. If, however, the things that are possessed being after some manner but not absolutely, how will their being under place not be manifested by their position and the limitation of the reasons in which they are established by nature, and their being wholly under time by their beginning? Do you see then that place and time are understood, to be, prior to all things that are? For the number of places and times, as Saint Augustine says in chapter 6 of the De Musica, precedes all things that are in them, for the mode, that is, measure, of all things that are created is, in the nature, of things, logically prior to their creation, and this mode and measure of each is called its place, and so it is. Similarly, the origin and beginning of its birth is seen to be logically prior to everything which is born and has a beginning, and therefore everything which was not and is has begun to be from a beginning in time. Thus, only God is infinite, all else is limited by a where, and a when? That is, by place and time, not that place and time are not in the number of those things that are created by God, but that they are prior, not in extent of time but only in respect of creation, to all things that are in the universe. For that which contains is necessarily understood as prior to that which is contained, as the cause precedes the effect, fire the conflagration, voice the word, and so on, and therefore we hold that no other beatitude is promised to those who are worthy, and, that there will be, no other end of this world, but the ascent beyond places and times of all those who shall receive the glory of theosis, that is, deification. For those who are bound by place and time are finite, but the eternal beatitude is infinite. Therefore those who participate in the eternal and infinite beatitude will be encompassed neither by place nor by time. For that which is written concerning Melchizedek alone, that he had no father or mother, nor a beginning of days to his attaining essence through generation, nor end of his time, must, I think, be understood generally of all who shall participate in the beatitude that is to come. For all who shall return into their eternal reasons which have neither a beginning of time, through generation in place and time, nor an end, through dissolution, and are not defined by any local position so that only, their eternal reasons, and nothing else, will be in them, will surely lack every local and temporal limit. For being infinite they will to infinity adhere in the cause of all things, which lacks all definition because it is infinite, for only God will be manifest in them when they surpass the limits of their nature, not that their nature perishes in them, but that in them he alone is manifest who alone truly is. And to surpass nature is this, that nature is not manifest, just as air, as we have often said, when full of light, is not manifest because the light prevails alone. Therefore, that which is understood generally of the place and time of the universal creature will necessarily be understood of the special and individual places and times of its parts from the highest downwards. But according to the intelligent place in general and time in general are prior to all that is in them, therefore the knowledge of special and individual places and times is prior to those things which are understood in them as species and individuals. And thus it is concluded that place is simply the natural definition and mode and position of each creature, whether a general creature or a species, just as time is simply the beginning of the movement of things through generation from not being into being, and the fixed measurements of this motion of changeable things until there shall come the enduring end in which all things shall be immutably at rest. The purpose of this reasoning is beginning to become clear, I think, for, as far as I can understand, it seeks to accomplish nothing else than to prove that place is simply the natural definition of each creature, within which it is wholly contained and beyond which it by no means extends. And from this it is given to understand that whether one call it place, or limit, or term, or definition, or circumscription, one and the same thing is denoted, namely, the confine of a finite creature. And although some think there are many kinds of definition, that alone and truly is to be named definition, which is usually called by the Greeks. Usiodis. But by our writers essentialis, for others are either enumerations of the intelligible parts of the usia, or corollaries drawn from outside by means of its accidents, or any kind of opinion about it whatsoever. But only the usiodis admits for purposes of definition that alone which fully completes the perfection of the nature it defines. For a definition, as Augustine says, admits nothing more and nothing less than that which it has undertaken to define, otherwise it is utterly faulty. You see it clearly. The foregoing argument seeks to show just what you have said. 
But I wonder and do not clearly see how the definition of each essence is said to be not within it but outside it, that is, how it can be said to be neither the whole nor a part of it. Be more attentive, then, so that you may learn this too. As much as the inner light allows. Tell me, pray, as all things are comprised in two genera for everything which is said to be is either visible and perceived, or can be perceived, by the bodily senses, or is invisible and contemplated, or can be contemplated, by the eye of the intelligence, either in itself or through something that is associated with it, in which of the aforesaid genera do you consider definitions to be? That is an absurd question. For who among the truly wise would put place, or limit, or definition, or any kind of circumscription within which each substance is confined, among the things which are accessible to the bodily senses, when he sees that the limits of the line, or triangle, or any plane or solid figure are incorporeal? For that geometrical point from which the line begins, and in which it ends, is neither the line nor part of the line, but its limit, and therefore its place is not perceived by sense but thought of by the reason alone. The sensible point, on the other hand, is part of a line, but is not its beginning or its end. Similarly, the line itself also, rationally considered, is incorporeal, and is the beginning of a surface. The surface is incorporeal too, and is the end of the line, but the beginning of a solid. But the solid also is incorporeal, and is the end of the perfection of the whole. For whatever there is in these that bodily sense has managed to grasp, that is, any point or line or surface or solidity that is visible surely consists of figures of incorporeal things, not their true substance, which is incorporeal. And similarly in the case of natural bodies, whether they are sensible by the proper mixing of the elements of which they consist or elude mortal powers of perception by their fineness, the limits of their nature are perceived by the intellect alone. For form, which contains all matter of bodies, is incorporeal. Matter itself, if one examines it carefully, is also built up of incorporeal qualities. So you think that it is to the genus of the invisibles that definitions, which we have called the places of circumscribed things, belong? Indeed I think so, and there is nothing that I see more surely. You think rightly. But as the genus of the invisibles may in turn be divided into many species, for there are some of the invisibles which are understood and understand, some which are understood and do not understand, some which neither are understood nor understand, in which of these species do you think that definitions should be included? Surely in that which understands and is understood. For the act of defining is the act of a reasoning and understanding nature. There seems to be no alternative. For no nature that does not understand that it itself exists can define either a nature that is equal to itself or one that is its inferior. For as to what is its superior, how can it get to know that when it cannot rise above the knowledge of itself? Therefore the intellectual nature alone, which is constituted in man and angel, possesses the skill of definition. But whether angel or man can define himself, or man-angel, or angel-man, is no small question, concerning which I desire to know your opinion. My opinion is that they can neither define themselves nor each other. For if man defines himself or the angel he is greater than himself or the angel. For that which defines is greater than that which is defined. The same argument applies to the angel. Therefore I think that these can only be defined by him who created them in his own image. From this argument I conclude that no other natures are defined by the rational mind than those which are inferior to itself, whether they be visible or invisible. Whosoever says this does not stray from the truth, and therefore wherever are the definitions of things that are defined, there too, surely, will be the places of things that are circumscribed. For from the reasons given above it results that place is definition and definition is place. It is evidently so. But the definitions, of bodies and of things devoid of reason, are nowhere but in the rational soul. In it therefore will also be the places of all things that are comprehended in place. But if the rational soul is incorporeal, which no wise man doubts, it is plain that whatever is understood in it must be incorporeal, and, place is understood in the soul, as has already been determined, therefore it is incorporeal. I see that this too is rightly concluded. For whether the angelic nature contains the definitions of the things that are inferior to it, as Augustine seems to hold, for the angels are also believed to minister to the things that are below them, or whether it eternally contemplates the things that are above it, that is, the eternal causes of things, this argument holds. For he is not severed from the truth, as I see, who believes that the human mind, though still burdened with earthly fantasies, 
can comprehend the created causes of nature's inferior to itself if he lives a pure life, but that the angelic mind seeks the eternal reasons of all things and, moved by love, is ever drawing human nature towards the same. You perceive rightly. Do you then see that place is simply the act of him who understands and by virtue of his understanding comprehends those things which he can comprehend, whether they be sensible or accessible, only, to the intellect? However, if this is so, then that which is defined is one thing and its definition is another. I see that they are different. But an intellect which understands itself seems to be the place of itself because it defines itself. It would not be unreasonable to say this either, if there is any intellect, after God, who is called the intellect of all things, that can understand itself. But if every intellect except God is defined not by itself but by that which is above it, no intellect will be the place of itself but will be placed within that which is above it. And did we not agree a little earlier on that this must be so? I think we must have a fuller discussion about this at another time. But now I should like to know whether the nature of the mind which defines, that is, which comprehends within the place of its knowledge everything which is understood by it, is different from the place itself, or definition of the thing placed or defined. I see that this is not unworthy of investigation either, for many are in doubt about it. But since we see that the liberal arts which are constituted in the soul are different from the soul itself, which is a kind of subject of the arts, while the arts seem to be a kind of accident which are inseparable from, and natural to, the soul, what hinders us from placing the method of defining among the arts? Attaching it to the art of dialectic, whose property is to divide and combine and distinguish the natures of all things which can be understood, and to allot each to its proper place, and therefore is usually called by the wise the true contemplation of things. For as in every rational and intellectual nature there are observed three things which are inseparable from one another and abide indestructibly for ever, I mean. Usia. And. Vidamis. And. Energia. That is, essence, power, and operation, for according to Saint Dionysius, these are eternally associated with one another, and are, as it were, one, and can neither be increased nor diminished, since they are immortal and immutable, does it not seem likely to you and consistent with sound reason that all the liberal arts should be held to be in that part which is called the Energia. That is, the operation, of the soul? For it has been rightly sought out and found by the philosophers that the arts are eternal and are immutably attached to the soul forever, in such a way that they seem to be not some kind of accident of it, but natural powers, and actions, which do not and could not withdraw from it, and which do not come from anywhere but are innate in it as part of its nature, so that it is doubtful whether it is the arts which confer eternity upon it because they are eternal and eternally associated with it so that it may be eternal, or whether it is by reason of the subject, which is the soul, that eternity is supplied to the arts, for the usia. And the power and the operation of the soul are eternal, or whether they coin here in each other, all being eternal, in such a way that they cannot be separated from one another. To this argument, since it is true, I know of no one who would dare to object. For each of your alternatives could be affirmed without coming into conflict with reason. But the one you put forward last is clearly more likely to be true than the others. But to return to the same problem, it is not quite clear to me how Omicron Sigma Alpha, whether in genera, or species or individuals, can be defined, since in earlier arguments in this book it was agreed that it is incomprehensible to any bodily sense or to any intellect. Nobody can define in itself or say what it is. But from the things which are inseparably associated with it and without which it cannot be, I mean from its place and time, for every created out of nothing is local and temporal, local because it is after some manner since it is not infinite, temporal because it begins to be what it was not, one can define only that it is. Therefore, Usia is in no way defined as to what it is, but is defined that it is, for from place, as we have said, and from time and from other accidents which are understood to be either within it or outside, is given not what it is but only that it is, and this could aptly be said of all. Usia. Universally, the most general, the most special, and the intermediate kinds. For even the cause of all things, which is God, is only known to be from the things created by him, but by no inference from creatures can we understand what he is, and therefore only this definition can be predicated of God, that he is he who is more than being. To this argument also none of those who are of sound understanding will, in my opinion, object. 
So now you see more clearly than daylight that those should be laughed at, or rather pitied, and therefore be recalled to a true discernment of things if they are willing, or should be left quite alone if they prefer to persist in their attitude, which is utterly inimical to truth, who hold the opinion that the parts of this visible world are the natural places of the other bodies which are constituted within them. 4. To speak for example of my own body, because to suppose that the soul is contained within the corporeal spaces of this world would be quite outrageous, if this air is its place, it follows that its place is the fourth part of it, for it is known to everyone that, every visible body, consists of four parts, namely, of fire, air, earth, and water. But nothing could be nearer to unreason than to suppose that the whole, of a body, is placed within a part of it. For the right view is that the whole comprehends all its parts but the part does not contain the whole. Also, if I should say that my body is in this air as in its place, it follows that it can have no fixed place, there. For this air is constantly revolving about the earth, and therefore a body placed in it must have at one and the same time an innumerable number of places, which reason does not allow at all. For it has been proved by earlier arguments that place is at rest and is not varied by any motion. So just as whoever stands or sits or swims in a river cannot keep to that part of the river so as to be able to say that he occupies a fixed place in the river, since it is agreed that it is unceasingly flowing by, so no one ought to call this air the place of his body, for it is unceasingly mobile and at no moment of time is at rest. But if anyone should object to this argument that earth, because it is always at rest, is correctly called the place of bodies, let him likewise consider that earth is the matter of bodies, not their place. And who, if he uses his reason, would dare to say that the matter of bodies is the place of the same bodies? Especially since matter in itself, if rationally considered, is neither in motion nor at rest. It is not in motion since it does not yet begin to be contained within a definite form, for it is through form that matter is moved, without form it is immobile, according to the Greeks, for how will that be moved which is not yet limited by any place or fixed time? And it is not at rest because it does not yet possess the end of its perfection. For rest is the end of motion. But how can that be at rest which has not yet begun to move? How therefore can the matter of a body be the place of the body which is made from it, when even matter itself is not, in itself, circumscribed by any certain place or mode or form, and, is not defined in any definite way save by negation? For it is negatively defined as not being any one of the things that are, since it is from it that all the things that are created are believed to be made. Again, if the parts of this visible world are the places of our bodies or of others, our places cannot be forever. For when the body of an animal has decayed and its parts return in separation to their natural abodes from which each was taken, its place, air, for instance, or water or earth or fire, will no longer exist, but the individual parts of the one body become so mingled each with the element whose nature it shares that it is one, with, it, though they are not in their elements as one thing in another. For that which is restored to air will be air, and is not, as it were, established in some place in the air, not that there is any confusion of bodies, but in nature's admirable way each will possess its own part in each of the elements as a whole throughout the whole, not as a part in a part, so that at the time of the resurrection no one will receive what is not his own, just as the light from many luminaries is joined together in such a way that there is in it no confusion and no separation. For while it appears to be one and the same light, yet each luminary possesses its own light not confused with the light of another, and yet in a wonderful way they all become a whole and produce a single light. Therefore air is one thing and its place another. In the same way, I think, must be understood the case of the other elements and of the restoration to them of the parts of bodies that have decayed. And if so, it will necessarily follow either that these general parts of the world are not the places of the bodies they pervade, and compose, or that the bodies themselves have no definite place or have no place at all, which the nature of things and a true view of it do not allow us to concede. For no creature can be without its own definite and unchangeable place and its own fixed duration and limits of time, whether it be corporeal or incorporeal, and that is why, as we have often said, these two, namely, place and time, are called by the philosophers. Onanef. That is, without which, for without these no creature which has its beginning by generation and subsists after some manner can exist. And to take the first example that comes to hand, if everything which surrounds a body is its place, then color will be the place of a body, for there is no visible body which is not surrounded by the light of a color. But if color is the place of a colored body, it will necessarily follow that a quality is the place of the body, but who is burdened with such appalling stupidity as to maintain that the quality of a body is the body's place? 
but if the color of a body is an incorporeal quality, and, being outside the body, surrounds it all about, that it is not its place will be evident to any wise man. On these grounds it is not allowed that this air or any other element of the world, although they surround the bodies that are placed within them, can, for all that, by any means be their places. Enough has been said about this. But I think, a few words, should be said against those who think that the body, and the body's essence are one and the same, being so deceived that they have no doubt, but that substance itself is corporeal and visible and tangible. For many, indeed almost all, labor under this error, not distinguishing the natural differences of things. Nothing is more tedious than battling against stupidity. For before no authority does it admit defeat, by no reason is it convinced. But since stupidity is not equal in, all, men, and their minds are not, all, clouded to the same extent, I see that a few arguments must be brought against them. Certainly they must. For if they profit from them there will be gain, but if not, we shall ourselves, from the exercise of our discussion, obtain a firmer grip on these distinctions of natures. Let us then carefully consider these few of the many syllogisms of dialectic, every body which is composed of matter and form, since it can be dissolved, is corruptible, but mortal body is composed of matter and form, therefore it is corruptible. Again, every Usia. is simple and admits no composition of matter and form, since it is an indivisible unity, therefore no Usia. is reasonably allowed to be a mortal body. Now this is said because every Usia. Although it is understood to be composed of essence and essential difference, for this is a compositeness which no incorporeal essence can be without, for even the divine. Usia. Itself which is held to be not only simple but more than simple admits essential difference, because there is in it the unbegotten, the begotten, and the preceding substance, nevertheless this compositeness, which is recognizable by the reason alone and which demonstrably comes about by no act or operation, is reasonably considered a simplicity. But for a firmer assurance that Usia. that is, essence, is incorruptible, read the book of Saint Dionysius the Areopagite, on the divine names, at that place where he deals with the nature of demons and their wickedness, saying, that it can corrupt no essence of either themselves or others, and you will find that he argues very subtly that nothing of the things that are, in so far as it is an essence and a nature, can by any means be corrupted. For there are these three things which in every creature, whether corporeal or incorporeal, as he himself demonstrates by the surest arguments, are incorruptible, and inseparable. Usia. As we have often said. Dynamis, energia. That is, essence, power, its natural operation. I request an illustration of these three. There is no nature, whether rational or intellectual, which does not know that it is, although it may not know what it is. This I do not doubt. Thus, when I say, I understand that I am, do I not imply in this single verb, understand, three, meanings, which cannot be separated from each other. For I show that I am, and that I can understand that I am, and that I do understand that I am. Do you not see that by the one verb are denoted my usia, and my power, and my act? For I would not understand if I were not, nor would I understand if I lacked the power of understanding, nor does that power remain latent in me, but breaks forth in the operation of understanding. True and truth-like. Then must not those who say that the material body is an usia either confess that their body is not composed of form and matter but is an incorruptible usia or be compelled by Trutton to admit that their body is corruptible and material, and therefore not an usia. Surely they must. But you seem to me to be denying not that every body in general is an omicron upsilon sigma alpha, but only every body which is composed of matter and form. Listen carefully then, so that you may judge that I was not speaking of some species of bodies but generally of every body, although I mentioned the special case of the body which is composed of form and matter for the purpose of the present inquiry directed against those who say that their mortal and transient bodies are nothing else than their Usia. And that there Usia. is nothing else but their body, which is material and composed of different parts, namely, of form and matter, and the various accidents. But that you may learn for certain that it is universally true that no body is an, take the following kind of argument. I will. But I see that first we must have some kind of regular form for this argument. For the foregoing reasoning was more like an argument from contraries than the model of a dialectical syllogism. 
Let this be the main theme. Whether is a corruptible body. All. Usia. Is incorruptible. Nothing incorruptible is a material body, therefore no. Usia. Is a material body. And conversely, therefore no material body is an. Usia. Again, no body which is composed of form and matter is simple, but all is simple, therefore no body composed of form and matter is an. Usia. Again. All men have one and the same. Usia. For all participate in one essence, and therefore because it is common to all it is the property of none, but body is not common to all men, for each possesses his own proper body, therefore. Usia. Is not common and at the same time a body, but it is common, therefore it is not a body. The same is evidently true with regard to the other animals and to inanimate creatures. This formula answers the purpose. Return, pray, to the general type of argument which you promised, whereby it is concluded that no body is an usia. Everything which is comprehended within length, breadth, and depth, since it is enclosed in diverse kinds of dimension, is a body, while that which admits none of these dimensions because it is one and simple and cannot admit into its nature any motion through space is necessarily incorporeal, but usia is not extended in length or breadth or depth, and because it remains indivisible in the simplicity of its nature is incorporeal, therefore no, being without dimension, is corporeal, just as no body, being extended in space, is an usia. I should like this too to be put in the shape of a regular dialectical formula. Let it be then the conditional form of syllogism, thus, main theme, whether usia is a body. If usia is a body it admits the dimensions of length, breadth, and depth, but usia does not admit length, breadth, and depth, therefore it is not a body. But if you wish to hear the syllogism of enthymima, that is, of the common concept of the mind, which holds the primacy of all conclusions because it is deduced from those things which cannot be at the same time, take a formula of this kind, a thing, is not both usia and not incorporeal, but it is Usia. Therefore it is incorporeal, for it cannot be simultaneously, true, that it is. Usia. And that it is not incorporeal. Again, a thing, is not both. Usia. And a body, but it is. Usia. Therefore it is not a body. Again, it is, not, true that a thing, is not both an incorporeal, but it is. Usia. Therefore it is incorporeal. There is therefore a very strong proof by which it is recognized that body is one thing and is another, for usia is divided into genera and species, while a body is separated as a whole into its parts. Again, a body is not a whole in any of its parts, for the whole body is not comprehended in the head or in the hands and feet, and it is greater in the sum of all its parts, but less in each of its parts when they are not taken together, while usia on the other hand, is whole in each of its forms and species, and is not greater in the sum of them when they are gathered together, nor smaller in each of them when they are separated from each other. For it is not more extensive in the most general genus than in the most specified species, nor less in the most specified species than in the most general genus, and, to take an example, Usia is not greater in all men than in one man, nor smaller in one man than in all men, it is not greater in the genus in which all species of animals are one than in man, alone, or ox, or horse, nor is it smaller in any one of these species than in all of them together. Again, a body can be cut up into parts so that its whole perishes, for instance, when it is resolved into those elements from which it is produced when they come together and form is added to them, it perishes as a whole. For when the parts are not together and are not contained within their proper form, by no act or operation can there be in anything a whole existing together, although they, i.e. the parts, can be conceived together in the thought of one who considers the natures of things. But it is one thing to be together in the reason's contemplation of nature, which always gathers together all things in the intellect and comprehends them inseparably as a whole, another thing, what is effected by the operation of the agent or the passivity of the patient in the way of separation or collection of sensible parts. For the reason of all numbers is in undistributed unity, and can neither be increased nor diminished, but corporeal or imaginary numbers can be both increased to infinity and reduced until they are almost nothing. On the other hand, Usia 
although, by the reason alone, it is divided into its genera and species and individuals, nevertheless remains indivisible by virtue of its nature and cannot be separated by any visible act or operation. For it subsists in its subdivisions eternally and immutably as a whole that is always together, and all its subdivisions are always together as an inseparable unity in it. And therefore although a body, which is nothing else but the quantity of usia, or, to speak more accurately, not the quantity but a quantum, can be separated into parts by an act and operation or at least by suffering its own fragility, itself, that is, the usia, of which the body is a quantum. The body is a quantum, remains immortal and inseparable by virtue of its proper nature. Now the reason why I added that a body is more rightly called a quantum than quantity is that those accidents which are called natural, when regarded in themselves as they naturally are, are incorporeal and invisible and are beheld only by the eye of reason, as being, about. Usia. Itself or within it and are, as it were, causes having their effects, as quantity itself and quality are, the cause of a quantum and a quali, and the other genera of accidents, of which I think we have said enough, that is, that whereas they are invisible, they produce visible effects. Therefore a body is not the quantity of usia, but a quantum, just as the visible color which is perceived about a body is not the quality of usia, but a quali constituted in a quantum, and so forth. I thought we might also introduce into our little discussion a sentence of the Holy Father Augustine from the book which he wrote on the categories of Aristotle, after the description of Usia. He says, seeing that a definition of it was impossible for the reasons I have recorded above, the next thing inevitably required was a definition of its accidents, of which the first is the quantum. Not without reason. For when we see anything it is necessary to estimate how much of it there is. But how much of it there is cannot be discovered unless it is surveyed under the application of measurement. If, then, one wishes to measure its length without regard to its breadth, length without breadth subjected to measure is called. Rabi. Not that there is any such thing as length without breadth, but because anyone who measures the length alone is said to measure a. Rabi. But when breadth is measured together with length it is called an. Epiphania. While if depth is brought into the measurement as well, altogether they constitute a body, but we do not take this body in the sense that we are used to take the natural, body, lest we should seem to be reverting to. Usia. This is said in order that we should know that these norms, of measuring, have their several existence in geometrical bodies, in which these three can be separately distinct, but they are inseparably associated in natural bodies, in which only by the intellect can quantity be separated from. Usia. For while one seems to be speaking of quantity, he is thought to be confusing things as though he were saying something about. Usia. Do you see what it is that this master of the highest authority is saying? When, he says, someone seems to be discussing quantity, that is, the dimensions upon which a body is constructed, he is thought by those who believe that. Usia. Is nothing else but the body which they see to be saying something about. Usia. Itself. If, then, geometrical bodies, which we contemplate only by the mind's eye, and which we only manage to construct from the images in our memory, subsist in some usia, then surely they are natural, and there is no difference between geometrical and natural bodies. But as it is, since we contemplate geometrical bodies with the mind alone, and since they do not subsist in any usia, and are therefore rightly called imaginary, while natural bodies are natural for the very reason that they subsist in their natural usia. That is, their essences, and cannot exist without them, and therefore are true bodies, otherwise they would not be contemplated in natural things. But in the reason alone, we are straightway given to understand that body is one thing and usia. another, since a body is sometimes without usia and sometimes, so as to be a real body, is associated with usia, without which it cannot become real but is merely a figure in the imagination, while usia, by no means requires a body in order to be since it subsists by itself. I think enough has been said about these things. Quite enough. But as I see, it remains for you briefly to discuss matter itself and form, of which you assert that material bodies are composed. For I think this must not be omitted, since it is not sufficiently clear to me whether it is the same form which underlies genus, and which combines with matter to produce a body. Of the forms, some are understood in. 
Usia. Others in quality, but those which are in. Usia. Are the substantial species of the genus. For of them genus is predicated because it subsists in them. For the genus, as we have often said, is whole in each of its forms, just as also the several forms are one in their genus, and all these, that is, genera and forms, flow from the single source of usia, and by a natural circulation return to it again. But the forms which are assigned to quality are properly called forms, only, in natural bodies, while in geometrical bodies they are called figures. For every geometrical body is comprised by spatial dimensions and figure alone, but by no substance. Every imaginary body is, of course, produced by the three general dimensions, namely, length, breadth, and depth, but not all geometrical bodies are circumscribed by one general figure. For some originate from the triangular figure, others from the quadrilateral, others from the pentagonal or from some other of the infinite number of polygons, others are developed from the circular surface, and thus, as far as the number of lines can progress from three onwards, so far can the manifold arrangement both of figures and surfaces be varied. Therefore the number of dimensions and lines in geometrical bodies is assigned to quantity, but the arrangement and position of sides and angles and the conditions of the surfaces are a property of quality, and this is called the geometrical form or, properly, figure. But as in natural bodies the number and distinction of their members are considered, whether they are separated by natural divisions or are naturally joined, nobody denies that these are the property of quantity, and that, on the other hand, the order and position of their natural parts or members are assigned to quality, and, are properly called form. For we say the form of man is standing upright and that of the other animals is stooping downwards. Hence those are called deformed who do not possess a suitable harmony of their members or are deprived of the beauty of color, which is produced in bodies from the fiery quality which is kala. For color stands for kala by the change of a single letter, and former is called after formum, that is, hot, by changing the syllable mum into ma. For the men of old called a hot thing formum, whence also forceps get their name, formum capientes. We are also accustomed to call enormous those who exceed the natural measure of their limbs, as it were without norm, that is, without measure. Do you not see that this consists not in the number and size of the members but in the position of the parts of the body, and in the light of its color? Or does it seem to you otherwise? Not, otherwise, in my opinion. But how this difference is pertinent to the question we have set ourselves I am waiting to know. Was it not settled between us by the reasons given above that body is one thing and Usia. Is another? Sufficiently and abundantly. So if by a natural distinction the quantity of a body is separated from the concept of its. Usia. Although they are attached to each other in such a way that. Usia. Is the subject of quantity and of a given quantum, while quantity itself or the given quantum are accidents of. Usia. Is it not clearer than day that the form which is beheld in. Usia. Not as an accident to it but as it itself is different from that which from quality in combination with quantity produces the perfect body? Now I see your drift. Do you think that I mean that it is the essential form which, in combination with matter, produces the natural body? Certainly not that. Rather I see that it is what you do not mean. Pray tell me how. From the aforesaid distinction of forms, namely into essential forms and qualitative forms, you appear to me to suggest nothing else, but that it is that form which is a species of quality that, when it is joined to matter, produces a body, of which the substance is. Usia. For these three are found in all natural bodies. Usia. Quantity, quality, but. Usia. Is always discerned by the intellect alone, for in nothing does it appear visibly. Quantity and quality, however, inhere invisibly in. Usia. In such a way that they break forth into visibility in a quantum and a quali when by uniting with one another they compose a body. For if the geometrical body, in which there is no ground of usia, is reasonably shown to consist only of the quantity of its dimensions and lines and the quality of its form, which is called figure, what objection is there to our saying that the natural body, whose permanence, in so far as it can be permanent, is grounded on the virtue of its usia? is produced by that form which is brought from quality into conjunction with the quantity which is taken from matter? For I think that you are suggesting nothing else than that we should recognize that it is from the concourse and commingling of the four elements of this world that the matter of bodies is made, by which, 
when whatever form from quality is added, the finished body is produced. For what is a difficulty for many is none for me. For they think we are going against ourselves and making affirmations which are contradictory and which conflict with our own opinion when at one point we say that matter is produced by the concourse of the four elements, at another that the cause of matter is the joining of quantity and quality to. Usia. Nor is this strange, for they do not know that the elements of this world are composed of nothing but the concourse of the aforesaid accidents of. Usia. For fire is produced by the conjunction of heat and dryness, air by that of heat and moisture, water by that of moisture and cold, earth by that of cold and dryness. And since these qualities which come together cannot by themselves become manifest, quantity supplies them with a quantum in which they can make a sensible appearance. For quantity is, as it were, a second subject after. Usia. And that is why it is placed first after it in the order of the categories, since without quantity quality cannot become manifest. Therefore, if the elements are made from quantity and quality, and the bodies are made from the elements, then bodies are produced from quantity and quality. Since, then, I perceive that you have accurately foreseen the end which I am pursuing, tell me, pray, whether you think this division of forms into two species each of a different genus, namely, forms of Usia and forms of quality, to have been established or not. I think it is established, and likely to be true, although it is not without some mental reservation that I allow it to be reasonable. For you would more easily persuade me that it is the addition of substantial, rather than of qualitative, form to matter that produces a natural body. For I would more readily believe that the cause which produces the body is Usia. than that it is quality. For it was established, I think, by reasons already given that quality is the cause not only of matter but of form, only that it produces matter by being mingled with quantity, while it is by itself alone that it casts form upon matter not that I do not know that a single cause produces out of itself many effects, for I see that from the single cause of fire breaks forth heat as well as light, and that light in turn is the cause of brightness and of shadows. Again, how many different bodies are made from one and the same matter? Into how many individuals is one form multiplied? And so forth and therefore I should think that Usia. itself, and not its accidents, becomes the form to matter. I very much wonder why what was clearly agreed between us just before has slipped from your memory. Consider, then, more carefully, and I will go over it again briefly. I am ready. Go over it again. Was it not definitely agreed between us that? Usia. Is incorporeal? Yes. And I should certainly assume that you have not yet forgotten that quantities and qualities, in so far as they are contemplated in themselves, are incorporeal, and do not subsist in any subject save. Usia of which they are the accidents, and that they abide in it inseparably. To this too I firmly hold. Must we not, then, say that it is probable that whatever results from quantity and quality, that is, every quantum and every quali, receives the cause of its establishment from no other source than Usia. itself, to which quantity and quality themselves are shown naturally to occur, as its first and greatest accidents, and without which they cannot be. For I see no reason why whatever proceeds from those things which are in the source should not be traced back to that very source, especially as Usia itself, in so far as it is Usia can by no means possess a visible or tangible or spatially extended appearance, but it is the concourse of the accidents which are in it or which are understood about it which, by coming into being, is able to create something sensible and extended in space. For quantity and quality combine together to produce a quantum and quali, and these two, combining together and receiving generation in a certain mode and at a certain time, manifest the finished body, for the other accidents appear to be added to these. For there are these four principal questions which we ask about our bodies and about those of others, whether animate or inanimate, how much is there of it? Of what parts is it made up, is it extended in the dimensions of length and breadth and depth? Of what sort is it, of upright and human form, or of stooping and animal? At what time was it born, or after what mode is it defined and established in itself so that it may not be infinite but a unity confined within its own genus? These things, as we have said, are primordially observed in our bodies, but by inquiring further beyond these we contemplate, in a loftier consideration, its Usia. Which is the source of substantial forms? For we say, of what? 
Ushiodis. That is, substantial, form is this or that body. Is it of human form, or equine, or that of some other irrational animal included within? For by these names it is not the bodies of the animals that are denoted, but, their, substantial forms. For whether we are considering ourselves or other animals, there are three things which we ought to know distinctly, what we are, what is ours, what is about us. We are our substance, which is endowed with life and intellect, beyond our body and all its senses and its visible form. Ours, but, not our own self, is the body which is attached to us and composed of a quantum and a quali and the other accidents, and is sensible, mutable, dissoluble, corruptible, and the truest thing to say of it is that it is nothing else but the organs or seats of the senses which are called by the Greeks. Estetiria. That is. Estiseontiria. Keepers of the senses. For as the soul is incorporeal and unable to reveal her operations by herself without the senses, and the senses themselves are ineffective unless they are kept in certain seats, the creator of nature created for the use of the soul a body in which she might keep certain vehicles of hers, so to speak, that is, the senses. About us are all the sensible things of which we make use, such as the four elements of this world and the bodies which are composed out of them. For our mortal bodies cannot survive without them. For they feed upon earth, they drink water, they breathe air, they are warmed by fire. To bestow growth and nourishment, earth and water, to provide life, air and fire. Two are passive, in so far as they pass into the body, earth and water, two are active, in so far as they kindle the furnace of the body, air and fire. For the power of fire, whose seat is in the heart, distributes the subtle exhalation of food and drink by hidden channels to the different parts of the body, and separates off the excrement into the privy. But unless the fire itself is fanned by the breath of air and fed by food and drink, as though it were by kindling wood, it quickly goes out, and without delay the whole frame of the body crumbles and falls and grows numb since the cold overcomes the strength of the heat. But the place for discussing these things is elsewhere. I accept this as probable. But I do not cease to ask myself of what kind their meeting with one another can be, how things that are incorporeal and invisible in themselves, by coming together with one another, produce visible bodies, so that matter is nothing else, and has no other cause for its establishment, but the tempered mixture, among themselves in themselves, and not in another, of things which are contemplated by the eye of wisdom alone especially as the great Boethius, outstanding among the philosophers of. Either tongue, asserts in his books on arithmetic as follows. Wisdom is the comprehension of the truth of the things which are and possess their own immutable substance. Now we say that those things are which neither increase by expansion nor diminish by contraction nor change by variation, but ever preserve themselves in their own vigor by relying upon the resources of their own nature. Now these are qualities, quantities, forms, magnitudes, smallnesses, equalities, conditions, acts, dispositions, places, times, and whatever is found united in some manner to bodies, which, although they are themselves incorporeal by nature, and vigorous by reason of, their, immutable substance, yet are changed by the participation of body, and at the touch of a variable thing pass into mutable inconstancy. These, then, possessing by nature, as has been said, immutable substance and force, are truly and properly said to be. Does not this opinion give us clearly to understand that matter and the body that is made out of it are something different from quantity and quality and the other things which are contemplated only by wisdom and which eternally preserve the immutable power of their nature, while the matter and body of which they are the accidents are diverse and unstable as a result of variable change? For, why, does it not seem likely that if matter consisted of the coming together of quantity and quality and the other natural accidents, it would of necessity also itself be immutable? For why is what is understood of the causes not also understood of their effects, so that, as the quantities and qualities and other like things are beheld by the eye of the mind alone, so too matter and body are subject not to the bodily senses, but to the intellect? But as it is, we perceive the formed matter of which the body is made with the bodily sense, for the unformed, matter, is nothing but intelligible, although we perceive quantity and quality only by the intellect. How then can quantity and quality produce matter, which is something very different from them? You are seriously misled, or wish to mislead others, by a false argument. But whether you yourself are in doubt about these things or are assuming the role of others who are in doubt about them I am not yet sure. I see that each is the case with me. For I was both concerned to put this question on behalf of others who justifiably are either uncertain about such matters, or are wholly ignorant of them, 
and I see that I too am not so clear about them that I have no further inquiry to make into the matter. I think, then, that reason and authority must be brought to bear in order that you may be fully clear about these things. For on these two is based the whole ability of discovering the truth of things. Indeed they must. For these questions have been asked by many, but few have found the answer. Say then, what do you think about the matter itself from which, when it is formed, bodies are made? By itself, when it is unformed, is it contemplated by sense or by reason? Surely by reason. For I dare not say by sense, since matter which lacks form cannot be grasped by any corporeal sense. You have answered correctly. But see that you do not again question us further about what you have now assumed. For we are wasting too much time over such matters when others more important await our consideration. Concerning what has now been defined between us by pure speculation I shall not, I think, trouble you further. But I keep wondering at your having said that more important matters await our consideration, for what should be more important, after God, for the reason to consider than unformed matter I do not see, when the questions it raises are, what is matter? What is form? What is made from matter and form? Whence comes matter? Is it to be included among the primordial causes which were created by God first of all, or even from the secondary causes which proceed from the primordials? Is it to be reckoned among the things which are subject to the senses, or among those which are to be allotted to the intellect? And can it be defined when it is still infinite, or is it definable even when it is finite? Which seems to conflict with reason, since it has been clearly established by the Holy Fathers that there are two, and two only, that cannot be defined, God and matter. For God is without limit and without form since he is formed by none, being the form of all things. Similarly matter is without form and without limit, for it needs to be formed and limited from elsewhere, while in itself it is not form but something that can receive form. And this similarity between the cause of all things, from which and in which and through which and for which all things exist, and this unformed cause I mean matter which was created to the end that those things which in themselves cannot be grasped by the senses might by some means have a sensible appearance in it, is understood in contrary sense. For the supreme cause of all things is without form and limit because of its eminence above all forms and limits. For it is not only the principal form of all things, but more than form, surpassing every form and forming everything that can receive form and everything that cannot. For it is both the form of the things that can be formed, because they either desire it or turn to it, and the formlessness of those things which, because of the excellence of their nature and their close similarity to itself, namely their cause, cannot be formed. For this formlessness of the things that cannot be formed is not called formlessness as if it lacked form, but because it is above every sensible and intelligible form, and that is why this cause of all things is usually predicated both affirmatively and negatively, it is form. It is not form, it is formlessness, it is not formlessness. For whatever is predicated of it can be both affirmed and denied, because it is above everything that can be said, and that can be understood, and that cannot be understood. Matter, on the other hand, is called formless by reason of its being deprived of all forms. For by it nothing is formed, but it receives different forms. You are not far from the truth. Does it not therefore necessarily follow that since formless matter is beheld only by the eye of the mind, I mean by the reason, it is incorporeal? Not even this would I dare to deny. It is incorporeal, then? It is indeed. I see that I am caught in my own judgment. Do you wish this to be confirmed by authority? Very much, and I pray that this be done. We find that many of those proficient in both profane and sacred wisdom have treated of matter, but it is enough to rely on the testimony of a few. St. Augustine in his book of Confessions asserts that formless matter is the mutability of mutable things which is receptive of all forms. And with this Plato agrees in the Timius, saying in similar language that formless matter is the receptivity of forms. From the unanimity of these two it can be defined in these words, formless matter is the mutability of mutable things, receptive of all forms. Saint Dionysius the Areopagite in his book. On the divine names says that matter is participation in adornment and form and species, for without these, matter, is formless and cannot be understood in anything. And from what Dionysius says can be gathered the following, if matter is participation in adornment and form and species, that which lacks participation in adornment and form and species is not matter but a certain formlessness. 
Therefore, whether formless matter is a mutability receptive of forms, as Augustine and Plato say, or a formlessness which lacks participation in species and form and adornment, as Dionysius says, you will not deny, I think, that if it can be understood at all, it is perceived only by the intellect. I have long agreed that this is undeniable. Again, do you think that the species and form and adornments themselves, by participation in which that formlessness or mutability we mentioned is changed into matter, is considered by any other means than by the eye of the mind? By no means. For as to form and species, without which there can be no adornment, it has been sufficiently demonstrated by the reasons given above that they are wholly incorporeal. So now you see that from incorporeal things, namely mutable formlessness which yet is receptive of forms, and form itself, something corporeal, namely matter and body, is created. I see it clearly. You admit, then, that bodies can be made from the concourse of incorporeal things? I admit it, since I am compelled by reason. Surely you must confess, since this is so, that bodies can be resolved into incorporeal things so as not to be bodies, any more, but wholly dissolved, while incorporeal things by their natural concourse and marvellous harmony produce bodies in such a way that they do not by any means lose their natural state and unchanging vigour. Just as, to employ a simile, shadow is produced from light and body, and yet neither the light nor the body is changed into shadow, shadow, on the other hand, when it vanishes, is understood to return into its causes, namely into body and light. For the right view is that the cause of shadows is body and light, in which their nature is latent because they have no place in which they can appear on account of the brightness of the light which surrounds the bodies on all sides. For they are wrong who think that shadow perishes when it is not apparent to the senses. For shadow is not nothing, it is something. If it were not so scripture would not say, and God called the light day and the darkness night, for God does not give a name to anything that is not from himself. Nor in that passage does the loftiness of the theory obscure the truth of the history. For if the actual events are there considered, we hold that darkness and night are nothing else but the earth's shadow cast by the rays of the sun that are poured around it, shaped like a cone, and always pointing away from the globe of light. And the same is true of lesser shadows by whatsoever kind of light and bodies they are projected, whether, the shadows, are finite or infinite and of whatever shape they are. Do not then be surprised that bodies are created from incorporeal causes and are resolved into them again, while the causes themselves are created by, and proceed from, one and the same cause that is creative of all things. For from the form of all things, namely, the only begotten word of the Father, every form is created, whether it be substantial or the kind which derives from quality and in union with matter generates body. From the same source also comes every formlessness. Nor is it surprising that from the form which is formless because of its eminence should come to be created the formlessness which is due to the privation of all forms, when not only homogeneous but also heterogeneous things, that is, not only things of a single genus but also things of differing genus, and not only those that are said to be or not to be because of their eminence. But also those of which this is said on account of privation, flow from the same source of all things. For, why, is it not now quite clear to you that it was not without reason that we said, on the authority of Saint Gregory of Nyssa, that bodies are made from the concourse of accidents, when you see that other authors, both Greek and Latin, assert that bodies are made from incorporeal things. And that was why I decided to introduce into our discussion the assumption of the aforesaid Father Gregory. For, disputing with those who say that matter is co-eternal with God, he says in the book on the image, nor does that opinion concerning matter which teaches that it has its subsistence from the intellectual and the immaterial seem to be inconsistent with what is deduced from what follows. For we find that all matter is produced from certain qualities, and that if it is divested of these it will by no means be comprehended by itself. Nevertheless, each species of quality is separated from its subject by reason but reason is an intellectual and incorporeal speculation. Thus, when some animal or piece of wood or anything else of the things which have the constitution of material things is submitted to our speculation, we get to know many things about the subject by way of division by the intelligence, each of which is related unconfusedly to what is being considered. For to take into account its color is one thing, its weight another, another again its quantity, and another, the particular way it feels to the touch. For softness, and two cubit length, and the other things that have been mentioned are not, from the point of view of reason, confused with one another or with the body. For in each of these is understood its special cause with regard to which it is interpretative, and none, of these, causes, which are considered about the subject is confused with any other quality. 
If, then, color is, solely, intelligible, and if solidity is, solely, intelligible, and quantity, and the other peculiarities of this kind, and if when any of these is withdrawn from the subject the whole concept of the body shall disappear as well, it will follow, for us, to assume that, of those things whose absence we find to be the cause of the dissolution of the body, the coming together creates its material nature. For as there is no body in which, thing, that is, a very clear. Usia and shape and solidity and extension and weight and the argument rest of the peculiarities are not present, yet none of these is a body but something else which is found to be a part beside the body, so, course of the on the other hand, when the aforesaid things come together, they accident produce the corporeal substance. But if the understanding of peculiarities is intelligible, and if God also is an intelligible nature, it is not at all inconsistent that these intellectual causes are supplied to the coming into being of the bodies from the incorporeal nature, the intellectual nature supplying the intelligible powers, and the coming together of these with one another producing the generation of the material nature. Do you not then see that this doctor's excellent and very powerful argument clinches the matter? For, if the body were something else besides the concourse of the accidents of Usia. When these were withdrawn it would subsist in itself by itself. For no subject which subsists by itself requires accidents in order that it may be. Such a subject is. Usia. Itself, for whether it has accidents or does not have them, whether there are in it things which cannot exist without it or whether things which, either by thought alone or by act and operation, can be separated from it withdraw from it, it always subsists without change by its own natural resources. But body, when the accidents are withdrawn, can by no means subsist by itself since it is not supported by any substance of its own. For if you withdraw quantity from body it will not be a body, for it is held together by the dimensions and number of its members. Similarly if you take quality away from it, what is left will be shapeless and nothing. The same view must be taken of the other accidents by which the body is seen to be held together. So that which cannot subsist by itself without accident must be understood to be nothing else but the concourse of those same accidents. So what is strange or contrary to reason in taking the excellent Boethius likewise to have understood by the variable thing nothing else but the material body which is constituted, as he says, from the concourse of things which really are, and that, as long as they are considered in it they must necessarily suffer a certain mutability. Nor is it strange that things which by themselves are immutable will be observed otherwise in their simplicity by the pure gaze of the mind than they will be seen by the bodily sense in their composition in some matter made from their own commingling, since we see that those things which are simple and incorruptible by themselves produce, when they come together with one another, something composite and corruptible. For who does not know that this mass of the earthly globe is made up of four simple elements, and that while it is corruptible and dissoluble, those elements from which it is produced all the same remain in their indissoluble simplicity. And this relation can be generally applied to almost all bodies. And I think enough has been said about these matters. Enough, surely. And I see that we must now return to a consideration of the rest of the categories. For there is no doubt that to hesitate longer over these matters is the mark of those who understand too little of the natures of things, and therefore I feel shame and regret for my slowness on many occasions. Do not feel shame or regret. For although the subjects we are discussing are so clear to the wise that none of them would feel uncertain about them, I have no doubt that, such discussions, are useful to the uninstructed and to those who are taking the path of reason from lower to higher planes. By no means is it to be doubted, and I see that this is the case with me. Go on to the rest. Two categories remain for examination unless I am mistaken, namely, those of acting and suffering. For in discussing place we said something of time as well, as much as was required for the purpose of the present inquiry. I am not now asking anything further about time or place, for what has been said about these is sufficient. For if one says concerning each subject, everything that reason seeks to be considered, the discussion will scarcely, if ever, come to an end. Consider, then, are action and passion predicated of God, or is it to be held that, as in the case of the other categories, they are employed metaphorically? Metaphorically, surely. For is it to be thought that these two override the rules that bind the others when they are seen to be of slighter power? Tell me, pray, how does it seem to you? Are not moving and being moved and acting and suffering? I see that it is not otherwise. Similarly, I think, loving and being loved. They come under the same rule, that these verbs and their like are actives and passives no one instructed in the liberal arts is ignorant. 
If then these verbs, whether they are active or passive in meaning, are no longer properly predicated of God, but metaphorically, and if nothing that is predicated metaphorically is said of him in very truth but after a certain manner, then in very truth God neither acts nor is acted upon, neither moves nor is moved, neither loves nor is loved. This last inference requires not a little looking into. For against it, as I think, there seems to be ranged the authority of the whole of Holy Scripture and of the Holy Fathers. For how often, as you know, does Holy Scripture explicitly affirm that God acts and suffers, loves and is loved, desires and is desired, sees and is seen, moves and is moved, and all else of this sort? The instances of these expressions, I have decided to omit lest they should lead to prolixity, seeing that they are innumerable and occur everywhere to anyone who seeks them, and the use of this single example from the Gospel is sufficient, Whoso loveth me shall be loved by my Father, and I shall love him, and shall reveal myself to him. Again, St. Augustine in his Hexameron, discussing the divine motion, has uttered these words, Now the spirit that creates moves itself without time and place. It moves the spirit that is created through time without place. It moves the body through time and place. If, then, acting and suffering are predicated of God not in very truth, that is, not properly, as we said above, it follows that neither are moving or being moved. For to move is to act, while to be moved is to suffer. Further, if he neither acts nor suffers how is he said to love all things and to be loved by all things which were made by him? For loving is a motion of the agent, while being loved is the cause and the end of the motion of the patient. But here I am speaking after the common usage. For if one looks into the nature of things more closely one will find that many verbs which have a merely superficial appearance of being active because of their sound. Yet in their meaning have a passive sense, and on the other hand what is superficially passive has an active sense. For he who loves or desires suffers himself, while he who is loved or desired acts. But if God loves what he makes he is surely seen to be moved, for he is moved by his love. And if he is loved by those who can love whether they know what they love, or do not know it, is it not certain that he moves them? For it is the love of his beauty that moves them. Therefore how it is said that he neither moves nor is moved lest it should appear that he acts and suffers is something I cannot find out by myself. And therefore the more insistently demand that you untie the knot of this question. Do you think that, in those who act, the agent is one thing, the ability to act is another, and the acting another, or that they are one and the same? My opinion is that they are not one, but three, differing from each other. For the lover, that is, he who loves, is a substance of a certain definite person, who has an accident of a certain potency by which this substance can act whether he does so or not, while if this substance moves itself by means of this potency so as to perform some act he is said to act. And thus there are seen to be three things, namely, a substance, and the potency to act that is in it, and the acting out of this potency upon some object, as the effect of some cause, whether this action be reflexive, that is, whether it turns back upon the same person, or whether it passes on to another. You draw a correct distinction. How does it seem to you? Must not the same distinction be observed in him who suffers, so that the patient is one thing, the potency to suffering another, and the suffering itself another, whether he suffers at his own hands or at another's? The same, surely. So these three are not of the same nature either in those who love or in those who are loved? They are not, in my opinion. For substances have one nature, accidents another. For he who acts or suffers is a substance, but the potency of acting or suffering and the acting and suffering themselves are accidents. I wonder how you have forgotten the questions which arose and were answered, I think, and finally settled in our earlier discussions. Please prompt me and call back to my memory what they were, for I do not deny that I am heedless and forgetful through a defect of the memory which is forgetfulness. Do you remember that it has been deduced and concluded by us that? Usia, dynamis, energia. That is, essence, as we have often said, power and operation, form an inseparable and incorruptible trinity in our nature which by the wonderful harmony of nature is so integrated with itself that the three are a unity and the unity is three, and that they are not as it were of diverse nature but of one and the same, not as a substance and its accidents but as an essential unity and substantial differentiation of three in one? I remember it and will never again commit it to oblivion. For to commit to oblivion the most apparent image of the Creator is a most foolish and unfortunate thing to do. But I do not yet see where this is to lead, 
Unless perhaps that when I was asked by you I replied that there were three things distinct from one another, one being in the nature of a subject while two are in the nature of accidents, and these three seem to be very different from the previous three, and thus either only those three which we said were of one and the same substance truly exist, that is, essence, power, operation, while those which I have now introduced, that is, substance and its accidents, namely, the possibility of acting and the effect of this possibility, which is acting, must be supposed to be superfluous and not to be deduced by reason, or the reverse, or again, which I think must be the more correct opinion, both the latter and the former exist in the nature of things and are distinguished by their own natural differences. But whether this is to be conceded or not, this I leave to your judgment to decide. What you proposed last seems to agree with right reason, for whoever says that the essential trinity, namely, essence, power, operation, is constantly and incorruptibly present in all natures and especially in rational and intellectual natures does not, I think, depart from the truth, and this trinity cannot be increased or diminished in anything in which it is present. But the trinity that comes after it is understood to be as it were an effect of the preceding trinity. For it does not conflict with the truth, I think, if we say that from essence itself, which is created one and universal in all things and common to all things and therefore, because it belongs to all that participate in it, is said, to be, the property of none of the individuals that participate in it, there emanates by a natural progression a certain proper substance which belongs to no one else but to him only whose it is. And furthermore this substance has its own possibility which derives from nowhere else but from the universal power itself of the aforesaid universal essence and virtue. Similarly with regard to the proper operation of the most particular substance and the most particular potency it must be said that it descends from nowhere else but from the universal operation itself of the same universal essence and universal power. Nor is it strange if these three which are considered in individuals are said to be a kind of accident of the aforesaid universal trinity, and its first manifestations, since it itself is by itself one and immutably abides in all things which have their existence from it and in it, and cannot either increase or diminish or be destroyed or perish, while these which are most particularly considered in individuals can increase and diminish and vary in many ways. For not everyone participates in the universal essence and power and operation in the same way, some do so more, some less, but no one is totally deprived of participation in it. Furthermore, it itself remains one and the same in all that participate in it, and to no one does it make itself more or less available for participating in it, any more than light to the eyes. For it is whole in each of them and in itself. But to be increased or diminished is a falling short of or a perfecting of participation, and therefore is not unreasonably judged to be an accident. For that which is always what it is is rightly called the true substance, while that which is variable proceeds either from the mutability of an unstable substance or from participating in accidents, whether natural or not natural. And do not be surprised that some accidents are called substances because they act as the substances of other accidents, when you see that to quantity, which is undoubtedly an accident of substance, other accidents occur, such as color which makes its appearance about quantity, and periods of time which are discerned in the limited movements of things. For time is the exact and rational measurement of the stopping and going of mutable things. This, I think, is exactly what I was driving at. But I should like you to give a brief and clear outline of this last way of considering things. Let us, if you agree, assume that the triple understanding of things, that is, of essence, of power, of operation, is established by the creator of all as the immutable subsistence and firm basis, of things. It must be assumed, I think. Then that trinity which can be contemplated in individuals and which proceeds from the first essential trinity must be regarded, as I see it, as the effect, as it were, of a preceding cause, and its primordial motions and a kind of primordial accidents. This too must be admitted. But whatever occurs to those three which come after, whether from within or from without, whether naturally or from some chance events, is seen to come about, as it were, as an accident of accidents. Again, I do not object to this conclusion. For since, according to Aristotle, there are ten genera of things, which are called categories, that is, predicaments, and we find that none of the Greeks or the Latins oppose this division of things into genera we see that all first essences, which the Greeks call see it, rightly, because they are by themselves, and do not require anything in order that they may be, for so they have been established by the Creator, like a kind of immutable foundations are included under a single genus, and they subsist in their wonderful and unchanging trinity in the likeness of the principal cause of all things, that is, as has often been said before, in essence, power, operation, 
while the other nine genera are said to be accidents and not without reason, for they subsist not by themselves but in the aforesaid essential trinity. For the name which the Greeks give to place in time. Onanev. That is, without which the other things cannot exist, is not to be understood as meaning that the substantial trinity we have mentioned is to be counted among the things which cannot subsist without place in time, for it does not require the aid of place in time to subsist since it exists by itself by the excellence of its own creation before and above place in time. But the nine genera which are allotted to accidents alone are so divided by our authorities that these accidents which are originally seen in essences soon change into substances because they act as substance towards other accidents. For the first division of all things is into substances and accidents, the second is of accidents into substances, and this division can be carried almost to infinity because that which is at the moment an accident of what is prior to it is soon made into the substance of what follows it. But of this we must speak elsewhere, while for the present, if you agree, let us continue with the subject we set ourselves. Well, then, is it your opinion that there are, no, accident but of some essence or of some accident? Nobody skilled in the arts would say otherwise. For accident was rightly so called for no other reason than that it occurs to an essence or substance, or to some accident. Are acting and suffering included in the number of the accidents? Certainly. Then they belong to some substance. For they are the accidents of particular substances, since to general essences no accident occurs. I would not deny this either. Tell me, pray, does any accident occur to the supreme and simple, and, divine nature? Far be it, from me to say such a thing. Is it an accident of anything? I would not say this either, for if so it would appear to be passable and mutable, and receptive of another nature. So it does not admit any accident and it is not an accident to anything? None surely, and to nothing. Acting and suffering are accidents. This too has been granted. Then the supreme cause of all things and supreme principle, which is God, does not admit acting or suffering. The force of this reasoning allows me too little space to maneuver. For if I say it is false, reason itself might easily make a laughing stock of me and forbid me to be unfaithful to all that I have so far admitted, if I say that it is true, it will necessarily follow that what I have granted in the case of acting and suffering I should also similarly grant in the case of the other active and passive verbs, of whatever class of verbs they may be, that is, that God neither loves nor is loved, neither moves nor is moved, and a thousand similar things, and what is more, that he neither is nor subsists. But if I do so, do you see under how many and how great and how frequent missiles of Holy Scripture I shall succumb? For their din is all about me, proclaiming that this is false. You are also well aware, I think, how troublesome and difficult it is to put such an opinion to simple souls when the ears of those who are seen to be wise are horrified when they hear it. Do not be afraid. For now we must follow reason, which investigates the truth of things and is not overborne by any authority, and is by no means prevented from revealing publicly, and proclaiming, to all men the things which it, both, zealously searches out by circuitous reasoning and discovers with much toil. For the authority of Holy Scripture must in all things be followed because the truth dwells there as though in a retreat of its own, but it is not to be believed as a book which always uses verbs and nouns in their proper sense when it teaches us about the divine nature but it employs certain allegories and transfers in various ways the meanings of the verbs or nouns out of condescension towards our weakness and to encourage by uncomplicated doctrine our senses which are still untrained and childish. Hear the apostle when he says, I gave you milk to drink, not food. For the purpose of the divine oracles is to convey to us and suggest concerning what is ineffable and incomprehensible and invisible something to think about for the nourishment of our faith. For concerning God nothing must be said or thought by those who live pure and pious lives and are serious seekers after the truth except what is found in Holy Scripture, and no meanings or allegorical interpretations but its own are to be used by those who either believe in or discourse about God. For who would presume to pronounce about the ineffable nature anything invented by himself, except such measures as it has played itself concerning itself upon its sacred instruments, I mean, the theologians? But in order that you may be more firmly convinced, I think the testimony of the theologian Saint Dionysius must be introduced at this point, if you agree. I certainly agree, and I welcome nothing more gladly than to have reason confirmed by the soundest authority. In the first chapter of the book on the divine names, this theologian has much to say in praise of the authority of Holy Scripture. 
but because in his usual way he expresses himself in an involved and distorted language, and therefore many find him extremely obscure and difficult to understand, I have decided to present his opinion on this subject by arranging his words in an order easier to understand than that in which they are written in their own place. We must by no means, he says, risk saying anything or forming any notion of the superessential divinity except what is divinely revealed to us by the holy oracles. For the superessential knowledge of the superessentiality which is above reason and intellect and essence must be applied, to the higher radiancies which are girt about by prudence and sanctity concerning divine things, fixing their gaze on high in so far as the illumination of the divine oracles inspires them. Do you see how he absolutely prohibits anyone from daring to say anything concerning the hidden divinity except what is said in the holy oracles? To which, namely the oracles, he gives a most glorious and most true name, higher radiancies which are girt about by prudence and sanctity concerning divine things. The same, theologian, in the same chapter a little later, writes. For just as the invisible things cannot be comprehended or contemplated by sensible things, nor simple things and things lacking likeness by those which are, moulded, into shape and likeness, nor the untouched and the unfigured formlessness of incorporeal things by things formed in the shapes of bodies, by the same principle of truth the superessential grandeur surpasses the essences and the unity above mind surpasses the minds. And the supersensible, one, is impossible to all virtues, and hidden from all reason is the superational good, the unity which unifies all unity and the essence which is beyond all essence and the intellect which is invisible and the word which is hidden, irrationality and invisibility and namelessness, existing after such a manner as do none of the things that exist, and, while causing the being of all things, is yet itself not an of, for it is the summit of all being, and in whatever other way it reveals itself properly and knowably. Therefore, as has been said, concerning this superessential and hidden divinity one must not dare to say or even to understand anything except the things which have been divinely expressed to us, for this is the way in which it has transmitted the most excellent revelation of itself in the oracles. For such knowledge and contemplation of it as there is, is inaccessible to all things that exist, being superessentially remote from them all. These words suffice on the necessity of following the authority of flowly scripture alone, especially in discussions about the divine. While reason is wholly concerned with suggesting, and proving by the most accurate investigations into the truth, that nothing can be said properly about God, since he surpasses every intellect and all sensible and intelligible meanings who is better known by not knowing, of whom ignorance is the true knowledge, who is more truly and faithfully denied in all things than he is affirmed. For whatever negation you make about him will be a true negation. But not every affirmation you make will be a true affirmation, for if you show that he is this or that you will be proved wrong, for he is none of the existing things that can be spoken of or understood. But if you declare, he is not this nor that nor anything, you will be seen to speak the truth, for he is none of the things that are or of those that are not, and no one may draw near him who does not first, by persevering in the way of thought. Abandon all the senses and the operations of the intellect, together with the sensibles and everything that is and that is not, and, having achieved a state of not knowing, is restored to the unity, as far as is possible, of him who is above every essence and understanding, of whom there is neither reason nor understanding, who is neither spoken nor understood, for whom there is neither name nor word. But not unreasonably. As we have often said, all things that are, from the highest to the lowest, can be spoken of him by a kind of similitude or dissimilitude or by contrariety or by opposition, since he is the source of all things which can be predicated of him. For he created not only things similar to himself but also things dissimilar, since he himself is the like and the unlike, and the cause of contraries. For right reason shows that by virtue of the things that are truly created by him, even, those which seem to be their contraries and which through privation of essence do not exist are contained, in him. For no vice is found which is not the shadow of some virtue, either by deception or by open contrariety, by deception, as pride wears the shadow of, true, might, luxuriousness of tranquility, rage of fortitude, anger of chastisement, and justice, and so forth, by contrariety, as wickedness of goodness. For as goodness conducts existing things out of non-existence in order that they may be, so wickedness strives to corrupt all things that are and to dissolve them utterly so that they may not be, and if this were so, that is, if all things were to perish, it also would perish at the same time, for if nature were done away, so also would vice be done away. But by the virtue of goodness all nature is sustained so that it may not perish. 
though up to now wickedness has been tolerated in her, namely, in nature, so that goodness may be honoured by contrast with its contrary, and the virtues exercised by a rational activity, and nature itself be purged when death shall be swallowed up in victory and goodness. Alone will both be manifest in all things and reign over all things, and wickedness will be totally done away. But there is a fuller discussion of these things in the fifth book. So do not let any authority frighten you away from the things which the rational deduction from right contemplation teaches you. For true authority does not conflict with right reason, nor right reason with true authority, since there is no doubt but that both flow from the same source, the wisdom of God. The one has conceded and conferred to pious inquirers the ability to think and say many things about the incomprehensible and ineffable nature, so that the study of true religion should not be silent on all matters, but nourish those who are as yet ignorant in the simplicity of the teaching of their faith, and that, instructed, and armed, and fortified by divine defences. It may have an answer for those who challenge the Catholic faith, while the purpose of the other is to correct, by the installation of religion and piety, those simple people who thus far have been nourished in the nursery of the church, lest they should either believe or think anything unworthy of God. Or should suppose that everything that Holy Scripture predicates of the cause of all things is predicated properly, whether it is a question of the most glorious and exalted names such as life or virtue or the names of the other virtues or intermediate names such as sun, light, star, or anything from the higher regions of this visible world which is predicated of God, or those, taken, from the lower motions of the visible creature, such as breath, cloud, brightness, sunrise, thunder, dew, shower, rainfall, also water, river, earth, stone, log, vine, olive, cedar, hyssop, lily, man, lion, ox, horse, bear, panther, worm, also eagle, dove, fish, monster, and the numberless other names which are taken from the created nature and applied to the creative nature by a kind of metaphor and figurative manner of expression, and, what is more strange, not only from the created nature did scripture in its ingenuity make these transpositions to the creator, but even from things which are contrary to nature, namely, frenzy, drunkenness, intoxication, forgetfulness, anger, rage, hatred, concupiscence, and other similar terms, by which the minds of the uninstructed are less seriously deceived than by the aforementioned metaphors which are taken from nature. For the soul, rational, to be sure, but somewhat simple, may be deceived into thinking, when it hears the names of natural things predicated of God, that they are applied to him properly, it is not, however, entirely gullible, so that when it hears the names of those things that are contrary to nature predicated of the Creator it either judges that they are altogether false and rejects them, or acknowledge and believes that they are said figuratively. I am not so much in awe of authority or so fearful of offending less capable minds as to be ashamed of announcing frankly the clear deductions and unassailable definitions of right reason, especially as discourse about such matters is held only among the wise, to whom nothing is more pleasing to the ear than true reason, nothing more delightful to investigate when it is being sought after, nothing more beautiful to contemplate when it is found. But I am waiting to hear what you intend by this reasoning. What do you think I intend by these arguments except that you should understand that as the nouns which denote the things, of created nature, whether substances or accidents, or essences, can be predicated of the creative nature metaphorically but not properly? So also the verbs that denote the motions of created nature, whether natural or not natural, can be predicated of it metaphorically but not properly? For if, the names, of essences or substances or accidents are applied to God not in a real sense but from the need to express somehow his inexpressible nature, does it not necessarily follow that the verbs also which denote the motions of the essences, substances, and accidents cannot be applied properly to God, who by the incomprehensible and ineffable excellence of his nature rises above every essence? Every substance, and every accident, every motion and every activity and passivity, and everything which is said and understood concerning such things, and everything which is neither said nor understood and yet which is within them. 4. Why, if God is called love by metaphor although he is more than love and surpasses all love, why should he not in the same way be said to love although he surpasses every motion of loving? For he seeks nothing apart from himself since he alone is all in all things. Similarly, if he is named he who acts an actor, he who makes an maker, not indeed properly but by a kind of verbal transposition, why should not, also, acting and making, or being acted upon or suffering, be predicated of him in the same manner of speaking? And I think the same must be understood in the case of the other verbs which denote all the motions of the mutable creature, whether natural or not natural, whether intellectual or rational or irrational, whether corporeal or incorporeal, whether local or temporal, whether straight or oblique or angular or circular or spherical. 
You strongly press me to admit that this is reasonable. But I should like you to bring in some supporting evidence from the authority of the Holy Fathers to confirm it. You are not unaware, I think, that what is prior by nature is of greater excellence than what is prior in time. This is known to almost everybody. We have learnt that reason is prior by nature, authority in time. For although nature was created together with time, authority did not come into being at the beginning of nature and time, whereas reason arose with nature and time out of the principle of things. Even reason herself teaches this. For authority proceeds from true reason, but reason certainly does not proceed from authority. For every authority which is not upheld by true reason is seen to be weak, whereas true reason is kept firm and immutable by her own powers and does not require to be confirmed by the assent of any authority. For it seems to me that true authority is nothing else but the truth that has been discovered by the power of reason and set down in writing by the Holy Fathers for the use of posterity. But perhaps it seems otherwise to you? By no means. And that is why reason must be employed first in our present business, and authority afterwards. Proceed in what order you like, for I am your follower. Do you think there can be any making or suffering without some motion of the maker or the sufferer? About the maker I have no doubt, for I do not see that it is possible for the maker to make something without some motion on his part. But how that which suffers experiences motion in itself, I do not yet clearly discern. Do you not see that everything that makes, something, moves itself or is moved to the end that it may move that which it seeks to make from that which was not into that which is? For nothing can pass from that which was not into that which is without some motion of its own and of another, whether it is conscious of those motions or not. I am not now speaking of that general motion that is common to all creatures, by which all things are moved from nothing into being, but of the usual motion in time by which everyday mutable matter, moved either by nature or by art, receives qualitative forms. I see now and reproach myself for being so slow-witted in not perceiving that everything that suffers suffers either its own motions or another's or both. Therefore the maker and the thing made suffer motions of their own. For that which makes suffers its motion towards making, while that which is made sustains its own motion and another's, its own by passing from that which was not into that which is, another's because it is not by itself the cause of its own motion, but, this is, either the natural motion or the free will or some necessity of him who makes it. Therefore that which is made, as we have said, suffers its own motion and another's, while that which makes suffers its own alone, although it may often happen that he who makes is moved to make by some other cause, so that maker and sufferer are seen to be one and the same. But this motion of the maker, although it may arise from various causes, either natural or voluntary or involuntary, is called his own for this reason, that it is understood, to be, not external to him but within him. I do not deny that you have convinced me of this, and therefore, I look forward to the rest of your exposition. I think no motion can lack a beginning and an end. For reason insists that every motion starts from some beginning and tends towards some end in which once it has arrived it comes to rest. And this, the Venerable, Maximus asserts most explicitly in the third chapter of the Ambiga, where he says. If God is immutable, as being the fullness of all things, but everything which receives being, from, the things that are not is moved, then certainly it is wholly born towards some cause. For, as the same Maximus teaches elsewhere, the cause of all things is the same, as, the end of all things. For God is the beginning, that is, the cause, of all creatures and their end since from him they receive their being and begin to be, and towards him they are moved in order that they may attain in him their rest. The same, author says, in the same chapter a little later, he is the motion of the things that have come into being, whether the intellectual motion of intellectual things or the sensible motion of sensible things. For there is nothing of the things that have come into being that is wholly, immovable. And a little later, now, this motion our holy instructors in the sacred science of the divine mysteries call natural power, which hastens towards its own end, or passion, that is, a motion which passes from one to another, of which the end is impassibility, or active operation. Of which the end is self-perfection. But none of the things that have come into being is its own end, for it is not its own cause either, otherwise it would be unbegotten and without beginning and immutable, as having nothing to which it could by any means move. For it would surpass the nature of the things that are, as having nothing for the sake of which to exist, for that is a true definition of it, although it is another's, which says, an end is that for the sake of which all things, are, while it itself is for the sake of nothing. Nor is it perfection in itself, otherwise it would not, have to, be made, as being complete, similarly it would not receive its being from anything either. 
for it would be perfect in itself, as also non-causal. Nor is it impassibility, otherwise it would be permanent as well as infinite and uncircumscribed. For suffering is not by nature present in that which is wholly impassable, which is neither loved by another nor moved towards something else by love. For to be an end and perfection and impassibility belongs only to God, since he is unchanging and fulfilled and impassable, while to the things that have been made it belongs to be moved towards the end that has no beginning. For all things that have been made suffer being moved, just as those things that are not are motion in itself and power in itself. If then the things that come into being are rational things, then they are also certainly in motion, since they are moved in accordance with their nature from their beginning by being, in accordance with their knowledge towards their end by well-being. For the end of the motion of things that are moved is the well-being in that which is eternally, just as the beginning also is being itself, which indeed is God, who gives both being, as a natural gift, and well-being, as a grace, since he is the beginning and the end. For our general motion is from him as from a beginning, and our particular motion is towards him as towards an end. But if the intellectual nature is moved intellectually as is rationally consistent with itself, it certainly also understands. But if it understands it certainly loves that which it understands, if it loves then it certainly suffers its outgoing towards it as something lovable. But if it suffers, this passion for it, it surely hastens, towards it, also, if it hastens, it is certainly embarked upon a powerful motion, but if it is embarked upon a powerful motion, it does not rest until it becomes a whole in the whole beloved and is comprehended in that whole. Freely accepting the whole in accordance with its choice as a salutary limitation, in order that it may become whole in that limiting whole, so that from itself it no longer wishes anything at all. Being able to understand that it is a limited whole, but from that which limits it, as air is wholly illuminated by light, and the whole lump of iron is liquefied by the whole of the fire. Do you see how this venerable master teaches that no motion is to be found except in those things which begin from an origin and proceed by their natural motion to their end? And how he defines this natural motion in three ways, thus, motion is a natural power hastening towards its end, or thus, motion is a passion coming from one to another, of which the end is impassibility. Or thus, motion is an active operation, of which the end is self-perfection. But as to his saying, motion is a passion coming from one to another. While this is understood of natural motion, it must not be understood as meaning that the origin from which the passable motion, that is, that which suffers its own motion arises is other than the end it seeks, for of all things which are naturally moved the beginning and the end are, but, one for it is God from whom and through whom and towards whom all things are moved. But what is thought of as a beginning is different from what is thought of as an end, and therefore these two meanings are spoken of, as it were, as two different things although they refer to the one beginning and end of all things, as for instance if someone were to say. From what is understood as the beginning to what is understood as the end in God. Then consider that everything which lacks a beginning and an end necessarily lacks all motion also. But God is anarchos, that is, without beginning, because nothing precedes him or makes him to be. Nor does he have an end because he is infinite, for it is understood that there is nothing after him since he is the limit of all things beyond which nothing proceeds. Therefore he does not admit any motion. For he has nowhere to move himself, since he is the fullness and the place and the perfection and the station and the whole of all things, or rather, he is more than fullness and perfection, more than place and station, more than whole of all things. For he is more than that which is said or understood of him, in whatever way anything is either said of him or understood. These things are quite clear to me, I think. If then you attribute all motion to the creature while you make God free from all motion, are you so slow-witted as to attribute making and suffering to him from whom you exclude all motion, when you have unhesitatingly admitted, I think, in your earlier and reasonable deductions, that these two cannot occur save in those things in which there is motion? About suffering I would have no doubt at all. For that God is impassable, I wholly believe and understand. By suffering I mean that which is opposed to making, that is, being made. For who would say or believe, still less understand, that God suffers being made when he is the creator, not a creature? For when, as we have long agreed, God is said to be made, this is said obviously by a figure of speech. For he is held to be made in his creatures generally because in them he, without whom they cannot be, is not only understood to be, but also is their essence. For the being of all things is the divinity that is beyond being, as Saint Dionysius says. He is also said to be made in the souls of the faithful when he is either conceived in them by faith and virtue or begins somehow to be understood through faith. For faith is nothing else, in my opinion, 
but a certain principle from which knowledge of the Creator begins to emerge in the rational nature. But about making I do not yet have a clear view, for I hear all Holy Scripture and the Catholic faith declare that God is the Maker of all things. You have already admitted that there cannot be making without a motion of the Maker. I have. You must either, then, allow motion to God, without which making is inconceivable, or you must deny Him both motion and making. For these two are counted among the things which go together and which arise and pass away together. I cannot allow motion to God, who alone is immutable, and has nowhere and nothing towards which to move himself, since in him are all things, indeed, since he himself is all things, on the other hand I cannot deny him making since he is the maker of all things. Then you will separate motion from making? I cannot do that either, since I see that they are inseparable from one another. What will you do then? I do not know, and therefore I earnestly beg you to open some way for me and to free me from this extreme difficulty. Adopt this method of reasoning then, what is your opinion? Did God exist before he made all things? It seems to me that he did. Then making was an accident to him. For that which is not co-eternal and co-essential with him is either some other thing outside him or an accident to him. I would not believe that there was another thing apart from him and outside him. For in him are all things and outside him is nothing. And I would not be so bold as to allow any accident to him, otherwise, he is not simple, but a composite of essence and accidents. For if another thing which is not himself is understood, to be, with him, or if there is something accidental to him, then surely he is neither infinite nor simple a thing which the Catholic faith and true reason most firmly deny. For they confess that God is infinite and more than infinite for he is the infinity of infinites and simple and more than simple for he is the simplicity of all simple things, and they believe and understand that there is nothing with him, since he is the periphery of all things that are, and that are not, and that can be, and that cannot be, and that appear to be either contrary or opposite to him, not to say like and unlike. For he is the likeness of like things and the unlikeness of unlike things, the oppositeness of opposites, the contrariness of contraries. For he gathers and puts all these things together by a beautiful and ineffable harmony into a single concord. For those things which in the parts of the universe seem to be opposed and contrary to one another and to be discordant with one another are in accord and in tune, when they are viewed in the most general harmony of the universe itself. You understand rightly, see now that you do not in what follows regret having admitted any of the things you now admit. Proceed in what order you please. I shall follow you, and shall not take back anything that I have conceded. God, then, did not exist before he made all things? No, for if he did, the making of all things would be an accident to him, and if the making of all things were an accident to him, it would be understood that motion and time were in him, for he would move himself to make the things which he had not yet made, and he would proceed in point of time his own action, which was neither co-essential with him nor co-eternal. Then his action of making is co-eternal with God and co-essential? So I believe and understand. A God and his making, that is, his action, two things, or one simple and indivisible thing. I see that they are one, for God does not admit number in himself, since he alone is innumerable and number without number, and the cause of all numbers which surpasses every number. Therefore it is not one thing for God to be and another to make, but for him being is the same as making? I dare not resist this conclusion. So when we hear that God makes all things we ought to understand nothing else than that God is in all things, that is, that he is the essence of all things. For only he truly exists by himself, and he alone is everything which in the things that are is truly said to be. For none of the things that are truly exists by itself, but whatever is understood truly, to be, in it receives, its true being, by participation of him, the one, who alone by himself truly is. Nor would I wish to deny this. Do you see, then, how true reason completely excludes the category of making from the divine nature and attributes it to the things which are mutable and temporal and cannot be without a beginning and an end? I see this clearly too, and now at last I understand without any doubt that no category applies to God. What then? Should we not examine in the same way the force of all the verbs which Holy Scripture predicates of the divine nature, so as to conclude that nothing else is signified by them but the divine essence and more than essence, itself, which is simple and immutable and cannot be grasped by any intellect or signification? 
For instance, when we hear that God wills and loves or desires, sees, hears, and the other verbs which can be predicated of him, we should simply understand that we are being told of his ineffable essence and power in terms which are adapted to our nature. Lest the true and holy Christian religion should be so silent about the creator of all things that it dare not say anything for the instruction of simple minds and in refutation of the subtleties of the heretics who are always lying in wait. To attack the truth and laboring to overthrow it and seeking to lead into error those who are less well instructed in it. Therefore to be and to will and to make and to love and to desire and to see and the other things of this sort which, as we said, can be predicated of him, are not different things for God, but all these are to be accepted as one and the same in him, and indicate his ineffable essence in the way in which it allows itself to be signified. Indeed, they are, not different. For where there is true and eternal and indissoluble simplicity by itself, there cannot be anything which is either this, and that, or which is much and various. But I should like you to tell me more explicitly, so that I may clearly see how, when I hear that God loves or is loved, I shall understand nothing but his nature without any motion of lover or beloved. For when I have been shown this I shall have no misgiving at all in reading anywhere or hearing that he wills or desires, or is desired, loves or is loved, sees or is seen, seeks or is sought, and likewise that he moves or is moved. For all these must be accepted in one and the same sense. For as will and desire and vision and longing to and motion, when predicated of God, indicate to us one and the same thing, so the verbs, whether they be active or passive or neutral and in whatever sense they are uttered, are understood not to disagree with one another by any difference of meaning, in my opinion. I think you are not deceived in this either, for it is as you think. First, then, take this definition of love, love is a bond and the chain by which the totality of all things is bound together in definition ineffable friendship and indissoluble unity. It can be defined in this way too, love is the end and quiet resting place of the natural motion of all things that are in motion, beyond which no motion of the creature extends. These definitions Saint Dionysius openly supports in the amatory hymns, saying, let us think of love, whether we are speaking of divine or angelic or intellectual or psychic or natural love, as a certain unitive and continuative power which moves the higher things to provide for the lower, and again those of equal form to exercise a close influence upon one another, and those things which are placed lowest to turn to those that are better and are placed above them. The same, author says, in the same, hymns, since we have given in order the many kinds of love which derive from the one, let us now, involve them all together again into the one and all-embracing love and father of them all and collect them together from, being, many, first comprehending in two general, virtues, all, their, amatory virtues. Over which absolutely commands and rules, from the summit of all things, the immeasurable cause of all love, towards which also is directed all the love from all things that exist in conformity with the nature of each existent. The same, author says, in the same, hymns, come now, and gathering these, that is, the virtues of love. Again into one, let us say that there is one simple virtue which moves itself to a unitive mingling, of all things, from the best to the lowest of beings and back from that through all things in order to the best again, spinning itself out from itself through itself towards itself and ever winding itself up again into itself in the same way. Rightly therefore is God called love since he is the cause of all love and is diffused through all things and gathers all things together into one and involves them in himself in an ineffable return, and brings to an end in himself the motions of love of the whole creature. Moreover this diffusion of the divine nature into all things which are in it and from it is said to be the love of all things. Not that what lacks all motion and fills all things at once is diffused in any way, but because it diffuses through all things the rational mind's way of regarding them, and moves it, for it is the cause of the diffusion and motion of the mind, to seek him and to find him and to understand him. As far as it is possible to understand one who fills all things in order that they may be, and in the pacific embrace of universal love gathers all things together into the indivisible unity which is what he himself is, and holds them inseparably together. Again, he is said to be loved by all things that were made by him not because he suffers anything from them, for he alone is impassable, but because all things seek him and because his beauty draws all things to himself. For he alone is truly lovable because he alone is the supreme and real goodness and beauty. For he himself is whatever in creatures is understood, to be, really good and really beautiful and lovable. For as there is no essential good so there is nothing essential, lie, beautiful and nothing essential, lie, lovable apart from himself alone. 
therefore, as that stone which is called the magnet, although by a natural power of its own it attracts to itself the iron which approaches it, does not move itself in any way in order to do this nor suffers anything from the iron which it attracts to itself. So the cause of all things leads back to itself all things that derive from it without any motion of its own but solely by the power of its beauty. Hence again Saint Dionysius says among other things, but, why do the theologians call God sometimes love but at other times desire, at other times lovable and desirable? He concludes his homily by saying, because, under the one aspect he is moved, under the other he moves. This conclusion the Venerable Maximus expounds more fully by saying, as being love and desire God is moved, while as lovable and desired he moves to himself all things which are receptive of love and desire. And this must be explained more clearly still, he is moved as bringing an inseparable bond of love and desire to those who are receptive of them. But moves as attracting through nature the desire of those who are moved towards him. And again, he moves and is moved as thirsting to be thirsted for and loving to be loved and desiring to be desired. For even this sensible light which fills the whole visible world, while it remains ever immutable although its vehicle, which we call the solar body, revolves in an eternal motion through the intermediate spaces of ether about the earth, nevertheless the light itself, flowing forth from this vehicle as from an inexhaustible source, so pervades the whole world by the immeasurable diffusion of its rays that it leaves no place into which it may move itself, and remains ever immutable. For everywhere in the world it is always full and whole, and it does not depart from any place nor does it seek any place save a certain small part of this lower air about the earth, which it leaves free for the purpose of admitting the earth's shadow which is called night, and yet it moves the gaze of all animals which are sensitive to light and draws them to itself that by it they may see in so far as they can see what they can see. And therefore it is thought to be moved, because it moves the rays of the eyes so that they are moved towards it, that is, it is the cause of the motion of the eyes towards seeing, and do not be surprised to hear that the nature of light, which is fire, fills the whole sensible world and is everywhere without change. For Saint Dionysius also teaches this in his book on the celestial hierarchy, and Saint Basil too affirms the same in the Hexaemeron, saying, that the substance of light is everywhere, but breaks forth by some natural operation in the luminaries of the world whether they be great or small, not only in order to provide illumination but that it may mark off the whole of time into portions by the motions of the celestial bodies. What shall I say of the skills which the wise call the liberal arts, which, while they remain in themselves by themselves complete, whole, and immutable, yet are said to be moved when they move the rational mind's way of regarding, them, to seek them, to find them, and attract it to consider them. So that they too, although, as we said, they are immutable in themselves, yet seem to be moved in the minds of the wise because they move them. And there are many other things in which an obscure likeness of the divine power is seen. For it itself is above every likeness and surpasses every example, and while by itself and in itself it is immutably and eternally at rest. Yet it is said to move all things since all things through it and in it subsist and have been brought from not being into being, for by its being, all things proceed out of nothing, and it draws all things to itself. And it is said to be moved because it moves itself to itself, and therefore it moves itself and, as it were, is moved by itself. Therefore God by himself is love, by himself is vision, by himself is motion, and yet he is neither motion nor vision nor love, but more than love, more than vision, more than motion and he is by himself loving, seeing, moving, and yet he is not by himself moving, seeing, loving, because he is more than loving, more than seeing, more than moving. Also, by himself he is being loved and being seen and being moved, yet he is not by himself being moved nor being seen nor being loved, because he is more than being loved and more than being seen and more than being moved. Therefore he loves himself and is loved by himself in us and in himself, and yet he does not love himself nor is loved by himself in us or in himself, but more than loves and is loved in us and in himself. He sees himself and is seen by himself in himself and in us, and yet he does not see himself nor is seen by himself in himself or in us, but more than sees and is seen in himself and in us. He moves himself and is moved by himself in himself and in us, yet he does not move himself nor is moved by himself in himself or in us, because he more than moves and is moved in himself and in us. And this is the prudent and catholic and salutary profession that is to be predicated of God, that first by the cataphatic, that is, by affirmation, we predicate all things of him, whether by nouns or by verbs, though not properly but in a metaphorical sense, then we deny by the apophatic, that is, by negation. 
that he is any of the things which by the cataphatic are predicated of him, only, this time, not metaphorically but properly, for there is more truth in saying that God is not any of the things that are predicated of him than in saying that he is, then, above everything that is predicated of him. His superessential nature which creates all things and is not created must be superessentially more than praised. Therefore that which the Word made flesh says to his disciples, it is not you who speak but the Spirit of your Father that speaks in you, true reason compels us to believe, and say, and understand in the same way with reference to other like things. It is not you who love, who see, who move, but the Spirit of the Father, who speaks in you the truth about me and my Father and himself, he it is who loves me and sees me and my Father and himself in you, and moves himself in you that you may desire me and my Father. If then the Holy Trinity loves and sees and moves itself in us and in itself, surely it is loved and seen and moved by itself after a most excellent mode known to no creature, by which it both loves and sees and moves itself, and is loved, seen, and moved by itself in itself and in its creatures, although it surpasses all that is said about it. For who and what can speak about the unspeakable, for whom no proper noun or verb or any proper word is found or exists or can come into existence, and who alone possesses immortality and dwells in inaccessible light? For who knows the intellect of the Lord? But before we end the present discussion I thought I should insert at this point the opinion of Saint Dionysius on the divine rest and motion, if you agree. Certainly I agree. And by this last piece of reasoning I see that I am purged of every doubt. In the book on the divine names, he says, but let us say what remains, to be said, concerning the divine station or seat. But what else is it but God's remaining himself in himself and being, after a unique mode, established in unchanging natural immutability, and his being enthroned above all things, and his, always, working in the same respect about the same thing in the same way, and his subsisting wholly from himself in his utter stability, and, his being, unchangeable and wholly immutable in relation to himself, and being all these things after a superessential mode? For he is causal of the station and structure of all things, who is above every structure and station, and who establishes in himself all things, immutable and preserved by the stability of their proper goods. Again, even when the theologians say that the immutable goes forth into all things and is mutable. Must not this also be divinely understood? For that motion of his is to be piously understood not as a carrying away, or as an alienation from oneself, or as an exchanging, or as a turning round, or as a motion in place, not in a straight line, not in a circle, not in a combination of the two, not intelligible, not psychic, not physical. But as God's bringing into essence and containing all things, and providing in every way for all things, and being present to all things by his immeasurable circumambience of them, and by his providential outgoings and operations towards all existing things. But it must also be permitted us to celebrate the motion of God the immutable in a manner befitting to God by the reason, and while motion in a straight line must be understood as the undeviating and irrevocable procession of his operations and the generation of all things from himself, helicoidal, that is, oblique, motion must be understood as his steady procession and fruitful rest. And motion in a circle as his self-identity holding together the middle and the extreme parts, the container and the contained, and as the return of those things which have come forth from him into himself. Our method requires, I think, that you should gather up into a brief conclusion what has been said about the impossibility of anyone properly predicating of God acting and suffering, or making and being made, and so bring this book to its end. You have long conceded, if I am not mistaken, that for God to be is not other than to act or make, but that for him it is one and the same thing, both, to be as well as to act and to make. For a simple nature does not admit the notion of substance and accidents. Yes, I conceded it with conviction. Therefore, just as being is predicated of him although he is not in the strict sense being because he is more than being and is the cause of all being and essence and substances, so also he is said to act and to make although he is more than acting and making and is the cause of all for making and acting without any motion that could be attributed to accident, being beyond all motion. For of all motions and of all accidents, as indeed of all essences, he is the cause and principle. To this too I would unhesitatingly agree. What is left, then, but that you should understand that it is altogether necessary that, just as strictly speaking being as well as acting and making are removed from him, so suffering and being made are removed. For how that which is not liable to acting and making can be liable to suffering and being made I do not see. Set an end to the book, for there is enough contained in it.